plane. I'm not in a plane. Oh, oh, this is cool. Okay, what has happened? What? Grabbing the squealer? Like Go away, you weird cloud farting freaks. Ah! And like that, I don't know how I'm supposed to. Oh! What was that? Dude, how am I supposed to play like this? Okay. That makes the first phase nothing. I think I hate this boss fight. It sucks getting to the last phase. Every attempt at this feels like an eternity. This, this section is weird. So this is like, yeah, we needed a th another phase for this. Yeah! It's a, it's a phase, I guess. So this first phase, relatively okay. Oh my, my fingers, I just... Okay, the controls weren't flipped and now they are? I can't figure out if the controls are flipped or not. Oh, super mega secret level. I'm here now and my life is so much worse. R control A, what? Here's a real high-class bout, and begin! Cuphead's presentation is its biggest and most respected accomplishment, hearkening back to 1920s and 30s cartoons with hand-drawn animation and painstaking techniques of the era. But while Studio MDHR nails the style and feel of that era, Cuphead leaves much to be desired in its game design. The game suffers from poorly structured bosses as well as unbalanced weapons and charms. In a previous video, I talked extensively about the DLC sees power creep and the clear imbalance of its weapons and charms, including Miss Chalice. I also detailed possible solutions to those problems. The video includes Studio MDHR's history and contains interviews regarding their design intent as well as analysis showing the DLC's betrayal of said design intent. However, that video is not required viewing for this one, so I'll link it at the end. For the rest of our comprehensive Cuphead analysis series, we'll focus on each DLC boss's upsides and downsides, their strengths and weaknesses, and the design principles behind them. While the DLC's bosses contain fantastic new mechanics and surprises, and of course an unbelievable step up in artistry and animation, they also suffer from structural issues. These structural issues being structural define the core experience of a boss. It doesn't matter how amazing the art is or how intelligently designed a specific mechanic may be, structural problems can turn even the best designed content into a slog, and in the process, break cohesion between boss phases and twist up what should be carefully planned thematic threads. This creates a challenge with inconsistent identity, lost potential, and even tedium. Tedium is a big topic, which I'm sure you've heard of, but what we want to explore in this video is where it comes from and how we can avoid it. Tedium poses a huge threat to any game due to its ability to turn otherwise well-designed content into a chore, but it's especially treacherous for games which operate off of the extended challenge, or gauntlet, like in a boss battler. Tedium always seems to be sneaking its way into boss battlers, and we want to know how to stop it. Believe it or not, tedium is mostly a structural issue, and a great boss to showcase that fact is the Howling Aces in Dog on Dog Fight. Soaring in as the first multi-unit boss of the Delicious Last Course, the Howling Aces reimagines the typical aeroplane shoot 'em up mechanic. Instead of playing as the plane, the player controls Cuphead on the plane. But, in keeping with the plane gimmick, the player still retains some control over the plane's movement. It's a level design subversion that works incredibly well. Oh god, wait, this is not- oh, I thought this was like in a plane. It does seem like yeah, there's, there's a hand. very high likelihood of being in a plane. Oh, we're whoa. not, we're not, Wait, we're, not, not, we're, we're on, on a plane. On a plane. Oh, I'm on a plane. I'm on, I'm on a plane, I'm not even, I'm on a plane, I'm not in a plane. Oh my God, and it is actually a dog fight. They're all dogs, guys. The little dude, it's the little guy that upgrades your plane. He's flying the plane for me, that's awesome. This is not a plane fight. Well, okay, it is a plane fight. Canteen Hughes, the drinking vessel plane mechanic NPC from the base game, makes a special appearance in this fight as he flies his plane to settle his beef against the Howling Aces, a bunch of dog pilots. And this is where you come in. Cuphead fights atop Canteen Hughes' plane and controls its movement by walking back and forth on its wings. The player moves the plane left by standing on the left wing, and right by standing on the right wing. The plane only moves by the player's inputs. 
Despite how much of a maneuvering nightmare this sort of meta arena control could have been, it's surprisingly intuitive. Each player-driven tilt of the plane feels deliberate with just enough floatiness to emulate a plane's motion, but not so much that the player is unsure how far the plane will move. When the player stops inputting, for example while jumping, the plane maintains a predictable motion curve, making it easy to judge exactly where it will stop. It's natural and intuitive and easy to tell where the plane is and will be. And on top of these smooth as butter controls, the boss's attacks accommodate the plane extremely well. Most of the attacks have a big telegraph window or are slow moving, so the player can predict exactly where they need the plane to be and win, and have plenty of time to get it there. What makes the plane such great design is its role as a facet of the arena, which generates additional types of challenges, rather than being a major challenge in and of itself. And when well used, the plane is just as much a tool for the player as it is for the boss. And that's what's so cool about it. The plane contributes to the challenge, but it's also there to help the player. And having that slow and deliberate yet responsive motion curve carries that purpose extraordinarily well. In addition, in addition to the mechanical fluidity, the plane also checks a bunch of boxes thematically, which is arguably just as important. Given that Cuphead's presentation, art style, and surrealist inspiration are primarily what make the game unique, it is just as important that the thematic elements complement gameplay as it is that the gameplay itself is solid. The interplay between storytelling and gameplay should be a primary focus, and the plane does that in a few key ways. Canteen Hughes conveys through visuals and sound that he's on Cuphead's side by shaking his fist at the boss and by clapping when the player completes a phase. It's a very us versus them, drinking vessels versus dog mentality. Okay, who is who is driving this plane? Who is that? Who is this character? Is he with me or against me? Because I don't know. Why is he clapping? Oh, he's with me there. The moving single platform that is the plane's wing also helps build that daring dogfight atmosphere. And the plane itself is present in all phases, which creates cohesion throughout the entire boss. All around, Studio MDHR did a fantastic job with the plane, and being integral to the experience since it's the only surface Cuphead can stand on, the plane becomes the core mechanic of the entire fight. And this is super important because as the core mechanic, every other mechanic and thematic element should relate to the plane in a significant way. Is that the case? Hmm, it's a mixed bag. Unfortunately, the plane is the best, most cohesive and thematic element of Doggone Dogfight, which is a bummer because the plane is just the arena. The boss itself is not nearly so well assembled. The Howling Aces suffer two fatal flaws, both arising from structural issues. The first, tedium, and the second, the lack of a unifying theme. Let's start with tedium. More than any other design flaw, Tedium has the potential to transform otherwise well-designed and fun content into a slog. That's exactly what Dog on Dogfight does. As we'll talk about soon, Dog on Dogfight has some well-designed moments, but ultimately its structural issues create too much tedium, and as a result, the whole thing suffers. What should be well-designed content instead becomes tedious. What do I mean when I say tedium? Tedium can be described as unnecessary repetition of content already mastered. Tedium has a few sources. It can arise from overly distant save points or checkpoints, which cause a player to repeat content too many times. Whoa, whoa! What? 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 No, but I... But this is even before the ocular upgrade! Why would you do that to me? I have to put the eyes back in again! What? Let's begin ah! by removing from Okay, actually, now I'm gonna save before I finish. That's a good idea. Then I don't have to do that again. Oh my god. Or it can come from the pure mind numbing dullness of repeating content which contains no more opportunities to learn or improve skills. Tedium is specifically a problem in Cuphead due to the nature of the extended challenge. 
In short, an extended challenge is a purposefully balanced, non-trivial collection of tasks that exist between two save points. In the extended challenge, players must complete that series of tasks, and they must do so within an acceptable threshold of error. In other words, players have to make it through the entire challenge without making too many mistakes. In Cuphead, this means beating every phase of a boss without losing all of your health. The boss phases are the individual tasks the player must complete, and the threshold of error is the player's health. Since Cuphead's bosses don't incorporate checkpoints, the entire boss must be completed in one go. The entire boss is the extended challenge. If the player runs out of health at any point during the challenge, the player must restart the boss from the beginning. You might know the extended challenge by another name, the Gauntlet. Some well-known examples of extended challenges are Nintendo's Super Mario Bros. and from Software's Dark Souls. In Super Mario Bros., the extended challenge is the entire game. The individual tasks are the levels leading up to facing Bowser in his castle, and the acceptable threshold of error is the player's number of lives. When you run out of lives, you restart the game. In Dark Souls, the extended challenge is getting to the next bonfire. The individual tasks are all the obstacles that prevent the player from proceeding, enemies, area hazards, bosses, etc. And the acceptable threshold of error is the player's health. When you run out of health, you respawn from the last bonfire and begin a new attempt. So now that we know what an extended challenge is, how does tedium affect it? Tedium impacts an extended challenge to a much greater degree than other types of challenges due to something called forced replay. Forced replay simply means the player is forced to replay the challenge over and over until they complete it. In Dark Souls, when a player dies, they are forced to respawn at the bonfire. Then, in order to get to the location where they died, they must fight through all the same enemies and obstacles they did the first time, with the exception of bosses. The player must replay a part of the challenge they've already completed before they can progress to a new part of the challenge. And each time the player dies, they have to go through this process again, replaying the same content over and over until they attain the skills and knowledge required to beat it, at which point they progress to the next extended challenge. In Cuphead, when a player loses all their health, that player is forced to replay the entire boss from the beginning. It doesn't matter how many boss phases the player beat, they always start from the beginning. The player must repeat this process until they can beat the boss all at once. Every single time a player is defeated, that player must restart from the beginning of an extended challenge with no exceptions, and the player must do this until they attain the skills and knowledge required to beat the challenge in full. This is forced replay. In an extended challenge, a specific instance of forced replay, for example retrying a level, may constitute a sizable chunk of the game. And due to the nature of forced replay, whereby one challenge must be completed before the next challenge may be attempted, replaying that same chunk of content can very quickly devolve into tedium. In the case of Cuphead, this may mean playing the first phases repeatedly while trying to get to the end. At some point, replaying those first phases becomes tedious. It's important to note that forced replay is not the cause of tedium. Forced replay just makes the player confront that tedium head on. Without forced replay, a lot of tedium flies under the radar. It's the interaction between forced replay and the extended challenge which makes a player notice tedium. Why is this? An extended challenge has two attributes which, when combined with forced replay, draw out tedium. Firstly, an extended challenge may be mandatory. With a mandatory extended challenge, a player cannot skip or in any way circumvent the challenge. In Mario, the extended challenge is the game. In order to circumvent the challenge, the player would have to not play the game. In Dark Souls, the player must proceed to the next bonfire. The whole point of the game is to get to the next area, and the bonfires complement that goal. These are both examples of games with mandatory challenges, just like Cuphead. In Cuphead, the player must defeat the bosses. Each boss is a separate, mandatory, extended challenge. The player cannot progress to the next island until they beat every boss on the current island. 
The opposite of a mandatory challenge would be an optional challenge. With an optional challenge, like with the optional challenges in Yakuza or like most of Skyrim, if a player becomes frustrated with an optional challenge, the player may at any point just walk away. There's nothing that forces that player to engage with the content. The player may continue to play the game, but instead focus on a different challenge. Once the player's frustration subsides, or the perception of tedium wears off, the player can go back to it, or they can decide to never revisit that content again. The player has the freedom to either engage with the content or not, and they don't have to stop playing the game to do that like in the case of Mario or Dark Souls. The tedium still isn't justified, but it affects the player less because they can walk away from it and potentially come back. The second attribute that draws out tedium is that an extended challenge has a fixed length. The challenge will usually exist between two static save points and it cannot be subdivided. This means that the player cannot manually save whenever they want. In Dark Souls, the player is not allowed to manually save in between two bonfires and subsequently respawn at that manual save point. Whenever a player fails the challenge, they will always respawn at that bonfire at the beginning of the extended challenge. In Cuphead, a given boss will have the same amount of health each replay. The player must defeat the boss by reducing that health to zero. If the player reduces the boss's health to half, Cuphead does not autosave or create a checkpoint. No, silly, there's no saving in the middle of the extended challenge. The player must complete the extended challenge in full, all in one go. The opposite of a fixed length challenge would be a variable length challenge, or one that may be subdivided via checkpoints or manual saves. In a game that can be manually saved whenever desired, the design intent is that the player controls their own checkpoints, so that they never have to replay content they don't want to. In this type of system, players are very rarely expected to fail and subsequently retry content, and if they do, they have a nice safety net. This limits the amount of content that needs to be replayed. For example, in sandbox games like Skyrim, there are checkpoints in the midst of challenges, and in addition to the checkpoints, the player has complete control over the challenge duration through manual saving. A challenge in Skyrim can be subdivided almost infinitely. With the ability to subdivide a challenge, plain tedious content will only affect the player in the moment. That tedium quickly passes because the save system ensures that the player never has to play through that terrible moment again. The content may still leave a bad taste in the player's mouth, but since it doesn't have to be repeated over and over, it can be quickly forgotten in lieu of new and exciting content. In games with extended challenges, the player has to interact with the same level, the same boss, the same enemy, the same phase, the same attack, over and over and over and over. And when the player has to do that thing again and again, that thing better be an exceptional experience. Because if it's not, the more times a player has to repeat content, the more tedious that content becomes, even if it was well designed. The content may be fun the first time, it may be fun the 10th time, but eventually that's gonna wear off. And the challenge must be structured to both mitigate tedium and persist for exactly the amount of time that it is still fun to replay. That's the nature of the extended challenge. From a design perspective, it demands perfection. Is that an unrealistic standard? Yes, but there are plenty of examples of well-structured extended challenges that are darn near perfect, so we know it's possible. And from those examples, we can glean some helpful structural guidelines. Now let's look at those guidelines. To keep things relevant, we're going to pull our guidelines from Cuphead's base game bosses. These guidelines can be applied generally in any game that relies on extended challenges, and I would call them best practice methods to avoid tedium in these cases, especially when using forced replay. Keep in mind these are guidelines, they are not rules. Every extended challenge does not need to use every guideline, and the fact that a challenge does not use a guideline does not mean that the challenge is bad. The guidelines are a lens through which to view, and thereby avoid, structural issues that contribute to tedium. For our purposes here, the extended challenge in Cuphead is defeating one individual boss, which includes defeating each of its phases in order, all without being reduced to zero health. 
Going forward, I will refer to the extended challenge as a multi-phase challenge. In this case, a multi-phase challenge is the same thing as an extended challenge, but the term is more precise. Cuphead bosses are divided into phases, each of which are distinct, which is not always the case with the more general term extended challenge. The first structural guideline which may be employed to mitigate tedium is upfront complexity. Upfront complexity simply means structuring a challenge so that the most complex aspects are introduced early on. In Cuphead, these aspects may be a boss's attacks, boss positioning, components of the arena, or a combination of these. Real quick, let's define complexity. Complexity is the accumulation of unique game elements which a player interacts with and or unique actions a player takes. Complexity exists on a scale. There can be high complexity because there are many game elements, or there can be low complexity because there are few game elements. The higher the complexity, the steeper the initial learning curve. The player has more to learn because there are more things to interact with and ways for the player to interact with them. In Cuphead, if you see a bunch of objects on the screen all at once, like in the DLC's High Noon Hoopla, that phase most likely has a high complexity. You can think of complexity as a measure of the game's initial possibility space. All of the different game elements and possible player actions exist within this possibility space and create possible gameplay. The more complex a challenge is, the wider the possibility space, since there are more possible combinations of game elements and player actions. On the other hand, a challenge with low complexity has few game elements and a narrow possibility space. Complexity should not be confused with depth or difficulty. Complexity is simply a measure of unique game elements. It determines how many different pieces the designers have to work with. Depth, on the other hand, is how all of those pieces interact. Depth is what gives the possibility space, well, depth. If complexity is the width of the possibility space, depth is the height of it, and the resulting area is all the possible gameplay. Depth is how all of the game elements relate to each other. You've probably heard Skyrim being described as wide as an ocean, deep as a puddle. This saying describes Skyrim as complex, being extremely wide with a massive amount of game elements to explore and interact with, but also very shallow, having few game elements that interact with each other in meaningful ways. Most of Skyrim's systems, the RPG elements, dungeons, quests, NPCs, etc. are individually shallow and don't interact. Skyrim relies heavily on the sublime, on the expansiveness of the game and the sheer freedom to go wherever the player wants. Once that wears off, there's not much to hold the player's attention anymore since the game itself doesn't offer any avenues for deeper learning or mastery of its systems. This is why when a player gets tired of Skyrim, they tire of the whole game at once. The mystique and wonder has worn off. Difficulty is, intuitively, how hard a challenge is to beat. In order to understand how these three concepts interact, let's look at a more specific example from Shovel Knight. We'll focus on two game elements in particular from the Enchantress boss fight. The platform rocks underneath the player and the Enchantress's fireball attack. Other than Shovel Knight himself, there are only two game elements at play in this scenario, the rocks and the fireballs. But watch how the interactions and interplay between them creates depth. The fireballs damage us, but they also destroy the rocks, which in turn reduces our playable space and increases the chance we fall to our doom. To counter the loss of playable area, the player may position themselves so that the enchantress throws the fireballs into less important rocks on the sides of the arena. Needless to say, the less often we have to jump over death pits in the middle of the arena, the better. The interplay between the player character, the fireballs, and the rocks creates depth. Consider instead if the fireballs did not damage the rocks. With no gaps in the floor, there would be no risk of falling and no reason for the player to manipulate where the fireballs go. The fireballs would become an extremely flat mechanic. The difference between high depth and no depth is quite clear and significant. Depth is what takes complexity and turns it into something greater than the sum of its parts. And since difficulty and depth exist within the width of the possibility space, they're all interrelated. Depth, difficulty, and complexity are so interrelated that if any one of them were to be removed, the whole game would fall apart. A game with zero complexity would have no game elements, making it nothing more than a story or a fancy electronic art piece. 
A game without depth would be without form. There would be no interaction between elements and no way for the player to engage with the game. A game with no difficulty is functionless, existing just to be experienced rather than played. Complexity, difficulty, and depth must all exist together in some capacity. But while all of the elements rely on each other, they're also semi-independent. Having a certain level of complexity does not impose a certain level of difficulty or depth and vice versa. It's possible to have low complexity while also having high difficulty or high depth. It's also possible to have high complexity and low difficulty or low depth, and any combination in between. For example, a bullet hell game which uses many instances of the same projectile on screen at one time may be difficult, but it is not complex. As another example, in Cuphead, Miss Chalice's double jump and parry, which afford her excellent air maneuverability, are not very complex, but they do create a lot of depth. Now that we know what complexity is, how do we use it? Remember, upfront complexity is simply introducing the most complex aspects early in the challenge. For Cuphead, this means placing the most complex aspects of a boss, or the widest possibility space, as early as possible, ideally in the first phase. The most complex aspect of a fight might be a boss's attack set or movements. It might be a multifaceted aspect of the arena, or it could be visual and audio cues, or whatever other game elements will increase the width of the possibility space the most. In other words, the more visual and audio elements or objects on screen, the more complex it will be. And we incorporate upfront complexity for one primary reason, and that is to conform to the principles of mastery. Let's look at an example to show how upfront complexity encourages mastery. Dr. Call's robot is an excellent example of upfront complexity, and oh boy is it complex. Dr. Call's robot's first phase is wild. During phase one, the robot has three destructible pieces, each of which spawns an attack. Those attacks also stay on the screen for some time. That's six unique, hostile on-screen elements the player must pay attention to, in addition to the attacks' visual and audio cues, as well as a small, occasional visual obstruction by the arena and Cuphead himself. In addition to that, once any of the destructible pieces are reduced to zero health, the destroyed piece spawns a different attack, which replaces the original. In addition to that, those destructible pieces can be destroyed in any order the player chooses. That's a lot of game elements just in the first phase. There's a fair amount going on. There's so much going on! Oh my god. Oh my god. This is freaking hard, man! <laughs> that wasn't even the first part! Let me just try and get a visual representation. We gotta parry that. I knew it, I knew it, and that reduces that. Okay, we watch the beam. So it's three things going on at any given time currently. Ooh, I don't appreciate now that you're firing like bombs with skulls on them. Let's not do that, okay? Let yeah, okay. Stay nice and close. You know what? This works. So then we keep our distance for those. Nice and close again. Whip that. Okay. And his hands. It's his hands. Woo! And he fires off little missiles as well. My strategy is to focus on the bottom one here then first, all right? Because we can also shoot these guys as they're coming through. You see that? So we can get the work done there. Whip that. Okay. Then dodge. Look at this. It's good. Oh, there's a constant beam. Well, there's all other things happening here I need to be aware of. All right. Let That's just a lot to have to find. What is going on? I haven't even done one percent. Just move around. They don't. They're very slow projectiles. It's not. A, not even a huge problem. <laughs> oh, and it's an airplane level. That much I could most certainly tell you without question, considering the fact that I'm apparently playing Space Invaders and Galaga all in one. What in the world? Why the fuck am I currently going through? Can I destroy this? I'd like to destroy this. We can try and focus on different areas when we're tagged in this, so we don't have to focus on shooting like the middle one first. I'm wondering if varying where I do the damage would be a good course of action. Let me get rid of the central one, because I don't mind that. It's the bottom one, which really messes me up. It's the deliberate pain this game tries to send you on. Who's on the $75 bill? George Lucas? Compared to the boss's other two phases, phase one is absolutely the most complex. This is even conveyed thematically when the robot's head breaks off and abandons its broken body, which has the added effect of reducing visual complexity as well. So how does Dr. Carl's upfront complexity encourage mastery? 
In Cuphead, each phase exhibits a certain amount of complexity and depth, and therefore contains that amount of possibility space. A player spending more time playing in that possibility space will experience more possible gameplay. And the more possible gameplay a player experiences, the more of that possibility space will be exhausted. In plain terms, the more time a player spends playing a phase, the more they will experience all of the possible gameplay in that phase. Experiencing all possible gameplay is essential for mastery. Mastering a challenge means improving at that challenge until the challenge is no longer challenging. In order to master a challenge, a player must become proficient in the entire possibility space so that there is no possible gameplay combination that proves difficult. A player must exhaust to the possibility space in order to master it. If we look at Dr. Carl's robot, we see that the first phase's possibility space is so large that it will take the player much longer to experience all of that phase's gameplay combinations than any other phase. Different projectiles can be dealt with in different orders and with different priorities. The robot's destructible pieces can be destroyed in any order, and any combination of projectiles might create a different situation for the player depending on where Cuphead is on the screen. The possibility space is huge! Compare that to the second phase where the gameplay consists of simply moving Cuphead up or down depending on where the robot head will show up next. And you can see just how much longer it would take the player to experience all of the possibilities in phase 1 compared to phase 2. And since a player will necessarily play phase 1 more times than any other phase due to forced replay, the player will exhaust a greater area of possibility space in phase 1 than any other phase. A big source of Cuphead's tedium comes from replaying sections of a boss which have already been mastered. So, if you want to eliminate that source of tedium, then ideally the player should never replay something they've successfully mastered. This means arranging the phase's possibility spaces so that the widest spaces come first, where the most time will be spent. In Cuphead, this is phase 1. Phase 2 should have a narrower possibility space than Phase 1, and Phase 3 should have a narrower possibility space than Phase 2. Incrementally shrinking the possibility space creates the ideal scenario where the possibility space of all phases are exhausted at the same time, that time being when the player finally beats the boss. Imagine instead a scenario where the most complex aspects of a challenge are placed at the end of that challenge. The player will spend most of their time in the early phases playing a possibility space that is smaller than the one they actually need to practice. Just like a musician would not practice an entire 3 minute song every time they practice the last 10 seconds of that song, a player should not have to play through a boss that they've already mastered every time they want to practice the last phase or attack. Every attempt at this feels like an eternity. I only wish I could drink from that flask and it was f***ing completely f***ing 100% proof vodka! Oh! It sucks getting to the last phase. Our second guideline meant to reduce structural tedium is late simplicity. Late simplicity means ordering our game elements so that the last part of a challenge is simple. Simple meaning relatively less complex. Put the simple things at the end. This might seem the same as upfront complexity, but there is some nuance. Upfront complexity means that you put your most complex elements first. Late simplicity means that you make the end of a challenge simple regardless of how complex the rest of it was. We use late simplicity for two reasons that play off of each other. To create space in the player's mind and to create space in the challenge itself. Firstly, at any point during a challenge, a player must keep track of any number of game elements. Decreasing complexity, or simplifying a phase, simply means removing some of those elements. By decreasing complexity, we decrease the mental burden imposed on the player. In other words, the player has less things they need to pay attention to and keep straight. And by reducing the number of things the player must pay attention to, we create space in the player's mind. That space is now available to use. Okay, cool. How do we use it? Our ultimate goal is to create engaging situations. We do this by combining all three, complexity, depth, and difficulty. These are the building blocks of games. We increase depth and or difficulty to create engagement. 
However, a player can only keep track of so many things at once, so the trio must exist in balance. When it falls out of balance, when we overburden the player, or even underburden the player, that's when we get tedium. Think of a rhythm game. In rhythm games, you'll often encounter a brief pause or reprieve right before a super difficult stretch of a challenge. The purpose of this reprieve is to reset mental burden. This is an example of a climactic clinch or drawdown, where the gameplay space narrows to focus on only one specific game element that is more demanding or formidable than the rest. While creating a climactic clinch is only one technique of storytelling, it can be especially effective in a multi-phase challenge. Simplifying the challenge is an effective way to maintain the balance while also allowing for an increase in depth and or difficulty. Our second reason to use late simplicity is to create space in the challenge itself. Creating space in the challenge is similar to creating space in the player's mind. Just like our first reason, decreasing complexity makes room for increased depth and or difficulty. But instead of focusing on mental burden, we focus on creating satisfying narrative action and a cohesive challenge. What does it mean to have satisfying narrative action? Well, in short, the challenge acts like a story. It has a beginning, middle, and end, and where the player starts is not where they finish. When they finish the challenge, it should feel as if the player has undergone a journey. Well, how do we do that? That sounds weird. <laughs> well, you're probably familiar with the three-act structure of storytelling, and if you're not, here's a quick breakdown. The typical story has three acts. The setup, which introduces the conflict. The confrontation, which ratchets tension and increases the stakes of the conflict. And then the resolution, which contains the climactic moment of the story. The most tense point where all the story elements or threads come together. If you view a multi-phase boss battle as a story, you can imagine how any boss could conform to the three-act structure. The first phase introduces the boss, the arena, and its distinct elements. The second phase expands on those elements and creates additional depth. The third phase brings all of the core skills and layered depth together at the point of highest tension and then resolves. And what unites all of these phases into one cohesive picture is the rising action. The rising action can be thought of as an increase in tension. As the boss progresses, the stakes naturally increase because the player is further into the boss and therefore further from the nearest checkpoint. Increased stakes mean increased tension. But that's not the only way tension increases. Tension has two other sources which may be directly manipulated, difficulty and depth. Difficulty generates tension because higher difficulty requires a higher skill expression. Greater required skill also means greater possibility for error. Higher chance for error, more tension. The player must become better. Depth functions essentially the same way. With more interaction between game elements, the player must build new skills. Therefore, tension increases. When the player builds new skills, they are undergoing a journey. That's what I mean when I say a player should feel like where they start is not where they finish. And this all ties back to mastery. Mastery is a journey. The player encounters a problem, they build new skills to handle that problem. So, in order to increase tension, in order to create that rising action, difficulty and or depth need to increase. But, if you just increase difficulty or you just create more depth, and at the same time you maintain a constant level of complexity, the challenge will lose focus. Too many game elements, plus too much interaction between those elements, plus too great a level of difficulty, just ends up being a convoluted mess. The player will not be sure what they're supposed to focus on, what skills they're supposed to build, or even what the point of it is. You'll end up with a challenge containing a bunch of disparate elements, which all overlap but don't necessarily relate. As a result, if the challenge loses focus, it will not provide narrative satisfaction. Without focus, the challenge cannot have a satisfying conclusion where the player feels like they've practiced a skill set, mastered that skill set, then beat the boss. So if you want to increase difficulty and or depth, and you want the player to foster new skills and build on old ones, complexity has to decrease. We need room for difficulty and or depth. Let's look at Dr. Cole's robot. 
Compared to the first phase, the last phase of Dr. Carl's robot is relatively simple. There are three game elements the player interacts with. Dr. Carl's gym projectiles, the electrified walls, and Dr. Carl himself floating around in an erratic manner. This translates to a relatively simple but fairly difficult phase where the player must move up and down between the walls while also accounting for Dr. Carl's erratic movement. It is generally a well-designed phase and a good use of late simplicity. However, the trio of complexity, depth, and difficulty are not as well balanced as they could be. The phase overstays its welcome, primarily due to a blatant overabundance of health. Oh no! Oh, oh so her. close! Oh, not that close, never mind, okay. Huh. <laughs> you actually still had a good way to stay. That was so intense, I got hit right at the end. Oh, and I was like, one life left, how long is this gonna go on for? Stop! Please stop this. Please. God, I was exactly halfway through the fight there. What the fuck? He's still going. It just keeps happening. There you go. Look at how much I'm dodging! Not even halfway. I can't! I died trying to get to you. How close were oh. we? We <laughs> were not even close. No! They can't be serious, but they what? This is ridiculous! Do we just keep going for the whole time? <laughs> I'm about to have an emotional breakdown. And then, like, you see the percentage done, and it's still, like, not enough. It's a long f***ing fight. <sighs> Like, is there any reason for me to say that? Like, I don't need to defeat a boss and say fucking cock. Because both complexity and depth are low, the player exhausts the relatively small possibility space quickly. And with a high difficulty, the player will likely replay the phase multiple times with very little mastery potential. A phase with low complexity and depth but high difficulty works ideally when the phase is kept short. Unfortunately, this phase is by no means short, and that's an understatement. However, it's still a pretty good example. All this to say that if you want to create a satisfying structure with a climactic ending, use late simplicity. All three, complexity, difficulty, and depth, exist in a balance, and late simplicity is one way to achieve that balance. So far, our guidelines have focused primarily on complexity. Based on our guidelines, a challenge should progress from complex to simple, from widest possibility space to narrowest possibility space. This prevents tedium by concentrating gameplay possibilities in the sections of a challenge that a player will spend the most time playing, the first phase of a boss, which has the added benefit of encouraging mastery. In addition, modulating the player's mental burden across the whole challenge reduces the chances for burnout, while also creating the opportunity for the rising action to terminate in a climactic ending. It's basically the best of all worlds. Depth is basically the opposite. Instead of a descending arc like complexity, we want an ascending arc. The challenge should start relatively shallow, but still meaningful, and work its way deeper. This ascending arc supports the rising action of a challenge, and is one of our two direct sources to create it. But in order to create depth, we have to employ our next guideline. The third means by which multi-phase challenges mitigate tedium is through early key learning, or more specifically, by punctuating early key learning points. Early key learning points are pretty much what they sound like. They introduce a mechanic or concept in a limited capacity, either with less depth and or easier difficulty, so that the player can learn and practice that mechanic before the mechanic evolves. Early key learning points lay the foundation for depth, and in doing so, encourage mastery and decrease tedium. For example, Super Mario Bros. introduces the moving platform very early in the game, and as the player progresses, the moving platform slowly evolves. The first iteration is a simple up-down platform. It's easy to maneuver through because a jump is unlikely to miss, does not require varying horizontal movement, and there's a backup platform underneath in case the player misses. The next iteration is a side-to-side -side platform. It's much more likely a player falls off a side-to-side -side platform than they do an up-down platform. The side-to-side -side platform also requires the player to jump from one to another, so it's a little more challenging. 
Further along, there are smaller up-down platforms, and multiple in a row this time. Later on in World 33, Mario has to traverse up-down platforms that fall when he lands on them, as well as jump to and from those up-down platforms while also navigating side-to-side -side platforms. What was once a relatively shallow mechanic now affects both horizontal and vertical movement, which affects how quickly Mario traverses the level, and it acts as both a hazard and a tool to either run into enemies or to evade them depth increases. But imagine if the game didn't have those early key learning points. Imagine if the game never introduced the platforms until World 3-3, and the first platforms the player ever encountered were the up-down side-to-side -side combinations. That would be potentially infuriating. Because of the nature of forced replay, the player would have to replay early worlds over and over just to get a shot at practicing all of these different types of moving platforms. The early worlds would become tedious. Let's look at Cuphead. Dr. Call's robot is, again, a pretty good example. Almost all of the robot's attacks act as key learning points for the fight's last phase. In the last phase, the player has to move up and down between the electrified walls while moving up and down and side to side to avoid the gym projectiles while also keeping on target. If we look at phase one, the antenna laser, the light bulb drones, and the chest bot with the electric wall all support this up-down movement. The home and death bomb teaches the side-to-side -side movement required to simultaneously move through phase three's electrified walls and keep on target. And the nut and bolt projectiles are a direct precursor to the gym projectiles. In phase two, the flying head forces the player to alternate between the top and bottom of the screen in the exact same way that the electrified walls do. There are a lot of key learning points here, and each of them does a pretty good job of introducing a mechanic in a limited capacity, giving the player time to learn. So if nearly all of the attacks in phases one and two are leading up to phase three in what should have been a climactic moment, why does phase three seem a little lackluster? In addition to phase three's overinflated health pool, phase three falls flat because despite all of the fight's key learning points, it doesn't really have any depth. Or I should say, phase three doesn't increase in depth relative to the other phases. All of the key learning points stressed the up-down side-to-side -side movement, but that's the thing. If the fight actually conformed to an ascending depth structure, whereby depth between game elements increases over the course of the fight, we would see each of those elements introduced gradually and in a way that starts with less depth and ends with more depth. In order to conform to the ascending depth structure, the fight might have introduced up-down movement or the side-to-side -side movement in the first phase. In the second phase, the fight might have focused on the other element. But phase one encompasses all of the elements in a more interesting package with a ton more total depth than the other two phases combined. It's not even close. By the time the player gets to phase three, they've already done all the things phase three has to offer. They've put together the up-down side-to-side movement and they've practiced staying on target despite numerous projectiles. There's nothing new, no additional skills the player needs to learn, no new interactions between game elements. It's the same thing the player has been doing the entire fight, just with less depth and more difficulty because the gym shoots a greater number of projectiles faster. It's boring, therefore tedium. Let's look at an example that incorporates early key learning a bit better, Calamaria. The theory behind Calamaria's stone gaze is really neat and effective. The idea is that the player reduces the number of projectiles by destroying the eels, then predicts where they need to position themselves so that when they're hit by the stone gaze and frozen in place, enemy projectiles miss them. The stone gaze is introduced in the second phase and carries on into the third. Each of the attacks in the second phase complement the stone gaze. The eels' attacks are crisscrossing projectiles that create a grid of safe zone, which the player must quickly identify and position within. This idea of the safe zone repeats in the third phase, but with a greater emphasis on predicting attacks. The third phase introduces new attacks which are each very simple, but which drastically increase the depth of the stone gaze. Each attack requires more forethought in positioning than phase two does. Not only that, but phase three ratchets difficulty and therefore tension by enclosing the space above and below. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. Oh, what? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, holy shit. What? Oh, he freezes me. He freezes me. Oh, shit. Come on.
Come on, come on, come on. I've gotten so close. I'm so close! The sudden increase in difficulty and tension works incredibly well for two reasons. For one, the core mechanic of the fight, the Stone Gaze, is an early key learning point first introduced in Phase 2. Because the Stone Gaze mechanic is introduced early on, it creates a more intuitive and gentler learning curve across both Phases 2 and 3. Keller Maria allows players to adjust to the new core mechanic and incorporate it into their skill set. Therefore, while Phase 3 ramps up its difficulty and tension, it also reduces the number of new elements for the player to learn at once. The player is already familiar with the Stone Gaze, so Phase 3 significantly reduces its chances of introducing tedium or overwhelming players. Phase 3 can safely increase its difficulty and depth for a satisfying, tension-filled finale. Come on. Come on. Yes, we did it! Oh! The second reason Phase 3's increase in difficulty and tension works well is actually related to late simplicity, but you'll often find that these structural guidelines work together to create the best possible experience. Phase 2's eels fill the screen with projectiles, which can also be managed by interacting with the eels and so increases the phase's complexity. Phase 3 then reduces the objects on screen to only two, the skulls and spiked columns, and decreases the playable space. Phase 3's complexity decreases. There's less to focus on, less mental burden on the player, and therefore Phase 3 can comfortably increase difficulty and tension without worrying about introducing tedium from an overcomplicated and overwhelming third phase. Overall, Calamaria's third phase only works because it introduces the core stone gaze mechanic as an early key learning point in phase 2, then simplifies phase 3 in order to further focus on the core stone gaze mechanic to increase depth, difficulty, and tension until the climatic, satisfying conclusion. What makes the Stone Gaze especially great, though, is that it reinforces the thematic presentation of the boss, pulling the phases together and creating a cohesive challenge. Reusing or reimagining a game element across multiple phases, in this case the Stone Gaze, creates a narrative thread that we can trace through the fight and which defines the core gameplay loop. Being such an iconic attack, the Stone Gaze really works as the core of this boss, and every other attack is simply an extension of it. Thus, we increase depth over the course of the fight, giving the player new skills to master and decreasing tedium. The fourth means by which multi-phase challenges mitigate tedium is through early replayability. Replayability is an elusive concept and one that's hard to define, but it generally means that repeated attempts or playthroughs will not significantly reduce a player's desire to replay content. You can imagine how important replayability is in a game that exercises forced replay. And again, given the nature of forced replay, the beginning of a challenge should be the most replayable, or else tedium. Since tedium is a surefire way to reduce a player's desire to replay content, tedium and replayability generally cannot coexist. Therefore, increase replayability, decrease tedium. There are many ways to foster replayability, but we're going to focus on the two most used, mastery potential and variety. We've already talked about mastery potential to an extent in this video, but if you want a much more thorough investigation, I talk a lot more about it in my video on the Cuphead DLC's items. If you haven't already watched it, I'll link it at the end of this video for your interest. The deeper the possibility space of a challenge, or the more depth a challenge presents, the higher the mastery potential. Games with high mastery potential typically have high replayability. Consider From Software's Dark Souls. Dark Souls is a series of extended challenges, back to back, from bonfire to bonfire. Any one of those extended challenges is typically linear. There are shortcuts and secrets, but most challenges have to be approached head on. This is how the gauntlet functions. The player must overcome the challenge in any way they can, given the tools at their disposal, weapons, spells, etc. Each time the player engages with the gauntlet, their skills improve, and they are more likely to succeed. But while player skill increases, the gauntlet never changes. The world map never changes either. No matter how many times the player replays a specific challenge, or even the whole game, they experience the same challenge. So if nothing changes, why do players enjoy playing the same content repeatedly? Replayability in this case originates from the player's urge to improve, and depth is the vehicle for that improvement. 
Without depth, there would be no room to improve. Improvement is also an active process. In order to increase their skill level, players must stay engaged. They can never just go through the motions. The challenges in Dark Souls force players to pay attention and adapt because the enemies and player characters' positioning and attacks all interact in a dangerous arena, which creates consistently engaging scenarios. If the game was shallow, there would be no interaction between game elements, and mastery potential and replayability would be small. What about variety? Variety is a simple, direct tool for increasing replayability. In the most basic terms, variety provides different stuff to engage with on each attempt. In a more technical sense, variety means that on any repeat attempt, a player will encounter a different selection of game elements. Variety should not be confused with the replayability from depth that we just discussed. Although both depth and variety are capable of creating unique situations, depth focuses on the interaction between game elements and actual mastery potential, while variety changes which game elements are present. Switching out game elements does not affect depth, nor, oddly enough, even complexity. Variety simply provides something new to discover on repeat attempts and nothing more, but it's still a useful tool in the right hands. When we're using variety, we want it to be in the right place. Place variety too late in a challenge and players will get stuck. They'll have to replay the whole challenge each time they practice the different variants. Keeping players stuck at the end of a challenge for too long introduces tedium. It is best, if a designer wants to use variety, that they place it early in the challenge. This is the same mindset behind upfront complexity. Jimmy the Great is a decent example of early variety with some flaws. In his first phase, Jimmy pulls out a chest that contains one of three possible attacks. The other two unchosen attacks are not used in that fight. When the player replays the boss, Jimmy chooses one of the three attacks again. By switching up the first attack of every fight, the player experience changes. In theory, this reduces the tedium of repeated attempts. In this example, the early variety is extremely simple. There's a list of attacks, the boss chooses one attack from that list to use. Variety can also be more complex. For example, a boss might change attack patterns, attack timing, states or stances, special abilities, status effect infliction, arena hazards, or any other mechanic that changes which game elements are in play. When using early variety, designers should be wary of a few different pitfalls. There are inherent difficulties in establishing early variety, especially with the grab bag type of variety like we see with Jimmy the Great. Firstly, when trying to increase replayability, using only variety does reduce tedium, but the result will not be particularly interesting or engaging. When we look at Jimmy, we see that his first attack has variety. It does not, however, have any depth. There is minimal interaction between game elements here. A complete lack of depth results in flat gameplay, and nothing variety can do will save it. Jimmy's first phase is not interesting or engaging, and therefore causes tedium on repeat attempts. Secondly, establishing key learning points becomes more difficult when the possible game elements are too numerous. It's difficult for the player to establish patterns or hone in on specific game elements that the designer wants to solidify. Jimmy falls into the same trap. Each of the three variations on his first attack teach a different skill. While each of these skills may be relevant for the boss, the player will have difficulty identifying them as actionable key learning points. Thirdly, and somewhat related to the previous point, too much variation can create too great of a mental burden. Jimmy doesn't have an issue with this, but imagine a scenario for me. You're playing a boss battler, and the first phase of a multi-phase boss has a dozen different variants. Each one of these variants spawn for each attempt, and for each variant, the player has to remember a specific visual or audio cue. This would obviously overwhelm the player and present too steep a learning curve. To avoid overwhelming players, most designers implement variation in groups of three. Lastly, each variant has to be balanced against each other variant. This is probably the most difficult trap to avoid, since each variant should be distinct enough to offer something unique, and unique elements rarely lend themselves to balancing. If one variant is easier than the others, the easy variant becomes boring and tedious. Not only will it introduce tedium, it also misrepresents the difficulty of the fight and undermines the rising action that we get from tension. 
Jimmy's sword attack is an absolute joke compared to his other two attacks. It's essentially free damage and a free parry. And what's worse, if the player doesn't get the sword attack, the player is incentivized to restart the boss immediately in order to minimize the chance they take damage from the more difficult attacks. This is a tedious strategy, and one, unfortunately, supported by the design. And we cannot be mad at players who, in all rational thinking, decide to take the path of least resistance. Now that we've defined these guidelines, it's important to reiterate that these are, in fact, only guidelines. Some of them may apply to certain challenges and bosses, while others may not be necessary or may not be the right tool for the job. It all depends on the context. So, we've talked about why tedium is important in an extended challenge, how forced replay exacerbates tedium, and what attributes of a challenge create opportunities for tedium. We've also looked at four structural guidelines that minimize tedium. Now that we have our tedium talking point ammunition, let's finally dive into doggone dogfight structural issues. Doggone Dogfight suffers from three structural issues. One, the fight abandons established skills and mechanics nearly as soon as they're introduced, causing each phase of the challenge to feel disjunct. Two, the poorly conceived transition phase, phase two, erodes any sense of tension established in phase one. Without tension, the second phase drags and the first phase becomes retroactively boring. 3. The immensely complex Phase 3 overshadows both of the other phases while introducing a new mechanic at the end of the fight which is way harder than all the others. This new, difficult mechanic causes players to fail and subsequently retry, meaning they have to play through most of the challenge in order to practice a small part of it. Repeating the first two phases over and over exhausts any fun a player might get out of them. When we combine all these structural issues together, we have a challenge containing three unrelated phases, the first two of which are boring, and the third which causes players to replay those boring phases. Naturally, we get tedium. Each of these issues seems simple when listed out like this, but they are far from it. To show you how we came to these conclusions, we're going to break down each phase in depth, starting with phase one. Phase 1 begins with a visual introduction of Sergeant O'Fara, the central antagonist of the fight, and Pilot Bulldog, our Phase 1 antagonist. After her introduction, Sergeant O'Fara zooms off in her Chinook helicopter to chill for a couple phases while her minions do all the work. Once Pilot Bulldog has his orders, the fight begins. Pilot Bulldog hovers in his plane at top screen, occasionally popping down on his jetpack to the left or right screen to shoot lateral yarn balls and returning crossbone boomerangs. His plane maneuvers side to side while his minion pops out of the wings and throws fanning tennis ball projectiles downwards. We also get a bonus attack in the form of Sergeant O'Fara's slow moving fire hydrant homing missiles coming from off screen. Overall, we have a very projectile heavy phase, in addition to the minor arena hazard of falling off Canteen Hughes's plane. For the most part, as a standalone phase, phase one is solid. However, multi phase challenges cannot be properly evaluated solely on an individual phase basis. They have to be viewed as a whole. Because, after all, a multi phase challenge will only ever be as strong as its weakest link. Each phase is an essential piece of the whole that will be replayed countless times, where any amount of tedium compounds with each additional attempt. That's the nature of forced replay. But we gotta start somewhere. Let's examine phase one through the lens of our four guidelines, upfront complexity, late simplicity, early key learning, and early replayability. We'll start with complexity. To begin talking about complexity, we must first define our game elements. I'm dividing them up into groups to make them easier to talk about. Phase 1 has three groups of game elements. The first group comprises all the elements that go into Canteen Hughes's plane. This is the movement, the platform, and the visual cues. The second group comprises all of the enemy projectiles and their visual cues. And lastly, the third group is Pilot Bulldog himself and his movement on screen. 
Each of these groups are, in and of themselves, complex aspects, the most complex among them being Canteen Hughes's plane. Canteen Hughes's plane contains multiple game elements all in one package. It acts as an arena hazard, a helpful tool, and a thematic guide. The plane achieves these purposes through interactivity. Unlike most game elements in Cuphead, Canteen Hughes's plane reacts directly to player input, beyond just a simple parryable or destructible element. This interactivity demands an entirely new level of engagement from the player. As opposed to simply reacting to a boss, the player can proactively change the arena. This is a unique feature of the DLC and one that really takes the fight to the next level. From a strictly mechanical point of view, Canteen Hughes's plane has three game elements. The first element is the most obvious. The player moves from side to side on the wings, and the plane shifts accordingly. The second element is more subtle, but goes hand in hand with the first. While the plane is in motion, and the player jumps, the plane continues moving according to a predictable motion curve. While this may seem like the same thing as the first element, they are separate because both moving the plane by standing on its wings and the predictable motion curve interact with other game elements in distinct ways, which we will discuss in greater detail later. The third element is the relatively small moving platform that is the plane's wing and its associated negative or void space, the arena hazard. If the player isn't precise with their jumps, they can fall into the negative space and take damage. We don't need to go super in-depth on the projectiles group or on Pilot Bulldog since neither of them introduce anything incredibly unique to Cuphead. It is enough to simply recognize that they are groups of elements and take up space in this phase. However, one thing to note about these groups is that they rely heavily on visual cues. Sergeant O'Fara's homing hydrant missiles are telegraphed way in advance, the yarn balls similarly so, and the crossbone boomerang is displayed on Pilot Bulldog as he slowly descends to fire them. These telegraph windows give the player plenty of time to adjust the plane. These visual cues are, themselves, game elements, and they exist to support the potential depth created by Canteen Hughes's plane. This is good. With all the elements defined, we can see that Phase 1's possibility space is very wide. There are a ton of game elements here, certainly enough to keep a player engaged. And with such a wide possibility space, the chance that a player exhausts that possibility space too early and encounters tedium is relatively low, as long as these conditions are met. Condition number one, phase one's complexity must be supported by a proportional level of depth. In other words, the numerous game elements must interact in meaningful ways. Without depth to tie the numerous elements together, phase one devolves into a hodgepodge of random attacks. In a mastery-based game like Cuphead, the depth must justify the existence of complexity. We'll see how phase one's depth holds up in a moment. Condition number two, phases two and three must not overstay their welcome. Again, anytime the latter phases of a multi-phase challenge take too long, the nature of forced replay will inject tedium into otherwise well-designed content. If phases two and three do overstay, then the possibility space of phase one will be prematurely exhausted. To ensure they don't overstay their welcome, phases two and three should follow a descending complexity arc. The number of game elements should decrease each phase, allowing room for increased depth and or difficulty without imposing too great a mental burden. Remember, the thing about multi-phase challenges is that each phase relies on each other phase to form a cohesive challenge. Phases 2 and 3 must support phase 1's existence, or else the whole thing breaks at the weakest link. If it sounds like I'm foreshadowing something about phases 2 and 3, you'd be correct. So, upfront complexity achieved, as long as phase one contains enough depth to justify that complexity, and as long as phases two and three don't cause phase one's possibility space to be exhausted too early. Moving on. Late simplicity. Just kidding, we're going to skip late simplicity since it doesn't apply to phase one and continue right into early key learning. Right off the bat, the player will notice that Canteen Hughes's plane is the star mechanic. Every other element is designed around it, from phase one through to phase three. And rightly so. The plane is unique and fun. As such an integral part of the fight, we would expect the plane mechanic to evolve and build new layers of mastery on top of the old. Each phase might require a new skill expression, or in some other engaging way, interact with the plane, so that by the end of the fight, the player feels there was a beginning, middle, and end to their mastery journey. They were introduced to the mechanic, they built new skills, then they put it all together and beat the boss. We introduce the concept in a limited capacity so that we can grow depth and increase difficulty as the challenge progresses. 
And that is exactly what Canteen Hughes's plane does not do. Unfortunately, this super cool mechanic that everything is built around is not done the justice it deserves. Canteen Hughes's plane is a static mechanic. It does not evolve as the player progresses. It does not create new avenues for mastery. No early key learning points apply. It's the same in phase one as it is in phase two as it is in phase three. Now, if you're familiar with this boss, you might think the wild screen rotation in phase three changes the plane mechanic. Uh, not quite, but we'll get to that in phase three. Don't think, however, that just because the plane doesn't employ early key learning, that there are no early key learning points in phase one. That is to say, there's one. Well, there's actually two, but one of the two is only relevant for the secret phase three, so I'm not even going to count that since most players won't encounter it through natural play. We'll talk about the secret phase more at the end of this video. To be fair, the one key learning point is important and does interact with the plane. What is that key learning point? Jumping over projectiles, which sounds boring just by itself until you consider the implications in regard to the plane. Remember how we talked about how our plane game elements in the previous section and how moving the plane is not the same game element as the predictable motion curve? This is where that comes in. The motion curve means the plane does not immediately stop moving when the player jumps. So forcing the player to jump, like with phase one's crossbone boomerangs, causes the player to interact with that motion curve. The player has to get good at judging where the plane is and will be. Jumping over the plane becomes a core skill in every phase, and the different projectiles in each of these phases slightly change the player's required skill. Early key learning point established. However, when viewed next to the plane mechanic, jumping over a bone seems way less interesting than the potential evolution of the absolute core mechanic of the whole fight. Moving on. Recall that for our purposes in this video, early replayability has two sources, depth and variety. To get a sense of how replayable phase one is, let's take a look at that depth. Now, if one wanted to talk about depth, a core mechanic would be a great place to start. A core mechanic is one which, ideally, all the game elements relate to and interact with. You could think of it like a holiday dinner. The turkey is the essential core of the whole meal, and the cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes, and stuffing all exist to complement that core. Core mechanics are the centerpiece of depth, and they help create a cohesive challenge. Not every challenge is going to have a core mechanic, which in most cases I would consider a design failure, but in this case we do have one. Oh look, we're back at Canteen Hughes's plane. The projectiles and Pilot Bulldog both serve to complement the plane, and if we look at each one of these, we can see the core mechanic at work. Both the projectiles and Pilot Bulldog are pretty boring. Both of them, just on their own and even in relation to each other, exhibit a shallow level of depth. But then you add in the core mechanic, and we get a depth explosion! In this case, the core mechanic makes the whole greater than the sum of its parts. Again, the core mechanic here is Canteen Hughes's plane. Without the plane, the relative shallowness of the enemy projectiles and Pilot Bulldog would have made for a boring fight without any rising action. But it doesn't matter that these other game element groups are shallow on their own because that's not how depth works. Depth takes into account all elements. Let's look at why this is effective and what it actually means for gameplay. The projectiles complement the plane mechanic exceedingly well. Unlike most bosses where the player simply moves Cuphead to avoid the projectiles, there's an extra step with the Howling Aces. The player's movement is restricted to the biplane, so in order to avoid the projectiles, the player must maneuver Canteen Hughes's plane across bottom screen. For each projectile, there is a biplane state or position that will minimize the player's chance of being hit. And those positions are largely conflicting. One projectile might be best countered in one plane position, while a different projectile might require another position. For the yarn balls, the player wants to be close to or moving toward Pilot Bulldog so that the yarn balls pass over their head as quickly as possible. The sooner the projectiles are past the player, the sooner the player can start moving again. For the crossbone boomerangs, the player wants to be directly center screen, so they have enough time to react to the boomerangs on both their forward path and also on their return path. For the fanning tennis balls, the player wants the plane to be stationary, allowing them to pass easily between the projectiles. And lastly, since Sergeant O'Fara's homing missiles are destructible, the player wants to be at a 45 degree angle to the projectile's approach from top corner screen. 
or wait until the player can safely move underneath it. Either method allows the player to aim and destroy the missiles before they get too close. In addition to all these projectiles, the player must also constantly readjust the biplane to stay on target as Pilot Bulldog's plane floats from side to side. So many conflicting elements might have been a muddled mess, except for the fact that all but the tennis ball attacks are very well telegraphed, giving the player plenty of time to react. Conflicting elements are key to depth. For example, the yarn balls are a catalyst for conflict here since they force the player to crouch and remain stationary. If the player moves with yarn balls over their head, they'll be hit. But if the player does not anticipate the other projectiles and pick a good spot to crouch, they could get hit by a different projectile, most likely a tennis ball. The player has to commit to their choice, a difficult task with so many projectiles. The crossbone boomerangs also serve a similar confounding purpose. The boomerangs force the player to jump in order to avoid them, but because Canteen Hughes's plane does not immediately stop when Cuphead jumps, the player must exercise air control to both avoid the boomerang but also ensure they land safely. Each of these interactions create unique and engaging situations. However, it's worth noting that much of Phase 1's depth relies on equipping standard non-homing weapons. In the previous video, we discussed how incredibly unbalanced the crackshot weapon is, allowing players to deal consistent damage while dodging, maneuvering, parrying, and otherwise not aiming at the target. And we can see that in play with Dog on Dogfight. In Dog on Dogfight, if the player has crackshot equipped, there is never a need to reposition the plane. The player can deal consistent damage even when the plane is out of position and the homing hydrants pose almost no threat due to Crackshot's homing. By eliminating the confounding effects of our different game element groups, Crackshot, to a fair degree, invalidates the core mechanic of the entire boss. How homing weapons can affect a boss and what we can do about it will be discussed in the upcoming Glimstone the Giant design video. For now, just know that when I speak of Phase 1's depth, I'm assuming that the weapons are balanced. Overall, Phase 1's depth is sufficient. Like we talked about in complexity, the interaction between game elements justifies the existence of those elements. The depth justifies the complexity. We have a reason for so many different game elements to exist. Without a reason, the entire phase would devolve into random nonsense, an inherent pitfall of surrealism, and the challenge would quickly become tedious. Depth justifies game elements. So what about variety? Our depth is good, but depth is only one of our two sources of replayability. Variety is another. So how about it? Is it used? No, phase one foregoes variety in favor of depth. There is no variety in this phase. The player will experience the same attacks, maybe in a different order, but with no variation in type. Pilot Bulldog's plane will always sway back and forth. Bulldog himself will always shoot yarn balls and crossbone boomerangs every single retry. Is there room for variety? That's a big maybe. When we consider the pitfalls of variety, and we consider that the current Phase 1 is a solid phase with a strong foundation of depth, it seems unlikely that Phase 1 would benefit from variety. Two of our pitfalls apply here, the first being that key learning points are difficult to establish when the game elements are switched up, and the second, that too much variation creates mental burden. Phase 1 already has an issue with key learning points. Any added variety might take away from the minimal key learning points that have been established. Adding variety would worsen an existing structural issue. Not good. And regarding mental burden, in this phase, there are already several game elements and their interactions that the player must attend. Adding any more would likely push that mental burden beyond an acceptable level. So, to answer the question, is there room for variety? Probably not. If there is room for variety, it would need to tie into the core mechanic, Canteen Hughes's plane, and not into our other two game element groups. Tying variety to the plane would minimize the effects of both pitfalls. Any additional key learning points generated from variety would, ideally, be based on the core mechanic, which would at least give the core mechanic a learning point. And for mental burden, tying variety to an established mechanic would make that variety easier to digest and keep organized in the mind. But even then, variety would most likely just confuse both the player and the phase. Overall, just utilizing depth, we have a pretty decently replayable first phase. Alright, so that's our four guidelines to reduce structural tedium applied to phase one. Overall, phase one is pretty well designed. Just by itself, phase one is not a big source of tedium. It has an acceptable number of game elements, which the level of depth supports, and the phase is replayable enough that a player likely won't get tired of it, given that the later phases don't overstay. 
Since a multi-phase challenge breaks at its weakest link, we have a lot riding on the second and third phases here. So let's move on to phase two. And unfortunately, phase two is where Dog on Dog Fight enters a nosedive. At the end of phase one, we see our little minion friends fire up their jetpacks as Pilot Bulldog goes blasting off again. <laughs> Reference. Thus begins the battle with the Yankee Yippers, the cute name officially recognized in the DLC's translator notes. In phase two, the Yippers fly circles around the player and shoot little bow wows at them. That's it. That's, <laughs> that's it. That's the phase. That's it. Compared to phases one and three, phase two is simple. That's probably an understatement. Phase two takes all of that established complexity and depth and interesting engaging situations and pitches them directly into the burning wreckage of Pilot Bulldog's plane. So go with the transition phase. This, this section's weird. So this is like, yeah, we needed a th another phase for this. So we just decided to throw these guys in here and kind of an underwhelming, like they're like, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a phase, I guess. I'm gonna take a moment here to talk about what a transition phase is and why it has almost no place in a multi-phase boss battler. Anytime a multi-phase challenge with forced replay includes a transition phase, there will be tedium. It's not even a question. Transition phases create tedium. What is a transition phase? Transition phases are short phases that sit between two other primary phases. Typically, they are simpler and exhibit a shallow level of depth. They usually exist to bridge the gap between thematic elements, or to distinguish between distinct, unrelated game mechanics, or in the pursuit of the misguided notion that more phases are better. Quantity over quality. Let's take a look at two transition phase examples from Cuphead. I want to be very clear up front, both of these are examples of what not to do in a multi-phase challenge with forced replay, but one of them is considerably more forgivable than the other. In Jimmy the Great's second phase, a series of walls with destructible elements block the player's path. The player must destroy the correct block in the wall while maneuvering around flying blades. Jimmy's second phase is a transition phase. You can tell it's a transition phase because the mechanics involved are completely unrelated to any of the other phases. The phase lacks any sort of depth. It's incredibly simple with only two game elements and playing it more than once makes you want to hit your head against the wall. Any rising action or tension the first phase mustered immediately evaporates in phase two. Replaying it is tedious. There is zero mastery potential and what's worse, it takes the same amount of time to complete no matter how skilled you are. There is no way to play this phase better. The player's skill level is practically inconsequential. Normally, when a player fights a boss, they constantly improve their skills. On each repeat attempt, they dodge more reliably and deal more consistent damage. In Jimmy's second phase, the player can still avoid taking damage, but they cannot demonstrate deeper mastery of or interact with any game element in any meaningful way. This phase checks pretty much every tedium box there is. Now let's look at Dr. Call's robot. In the second phase, the player moves up and down to avoid the big robot head as it zooms around the screen while also avoiding the electric death bombs. This transition phase for Dr. Call's robot, while simple and lacking depth, is not nearly so offensive as Jimmy's transition phase. Why? Let me tell you, the robot's transition phase is relevant. It acts as a key learning point. As we talked about in the key learning points section, the act of moving up and down to avoid the robot head solidifies that avoidance maneuver as a core skill. That avoidance maneuver is immediately repeated in the third phase in the form of the electrified walls. Without introducing the maneuver ahead of time, the third phase might have had too high of a learning curve, which would introduce tedium. However, this raises some questions. If the player has to practice the maneuver regardless, why not let them practice it sooner? Why not implement it in the first phase? Or why not just get rid of the transition phase altogether and let the player arrive at phase three, the phase they actually need to practice sooner? By letting the player get on with it, they would spend more time on the difficult phase, but less time overall. Or, here's a crazy idea if you really need to inflate that playtime. Make the transition phase a real phase with depth and engaging scenarios and which resonates with the core mechanic of the fight. That is, if the fight was designed well enough in the first place to have a core mechanic. And then, shorten phase 3. If the transition phase exists just to be gotten through, why have it at all? 
So if transition phases are just so awful, why use them? The first reason one might use a transition phase is to introduce a new mechanic that otherwise does not fit elsewhere. And I stress that last part. The mechanic you want to introduce in the transition phase cannot fit anywhere else. Recall Dr. Call's robot's first phase. That phase is deep. It is also complex. The possibility space is huge. And with so much going on, there simply isn't room for another key learning point. The phase is jam-packed full of game elements, and all those projectiles and moving elements force the player to maneuver constantly. To an extent, in that maneuvering, the up-down avoidance is present, but it was not so nearly the focus as it is in Phase 2. Making it more of a focus in Phase 1 would have proved too much. In fact, adding anything to Phase 1 would create too much mental burden. The key learning point simply doesn't fit. Then, there's the thematic reason for using transition phases. We'll talk more about this later, but a transition phase may be used to create a narrative or thematic breaking point, which ideally launches the rising action forward as opposed to stalling it. However, theme and mechanics go hand in hand. Mechanics must support theme in the same way that theme must support mechanics. A transition phase cannot be justified on solely a thematic basis, at least not in the case of forced replay. If a phase exists solely for thematic reasons, forced replay forces the player to replay that phase which has no mechanical significance, and therefore no gameplay significance. We do not want a phase in our game that is not a part of the game. And that's pretty much the only reason why anyone should ever use a transition phase in a multi-phase challenge with forced replay. Only time to use a transition phase is when a core mechanic must be introduced but doesn't fit anywhere else. I repeat, exhaust all possibilities first. If you think you need a transition phase, you're probably wrong. Back to Dog on Dogfight, phase 2, the transition phase. Dog on Dog Fight's second phase is a transition phase. And if you couldn't guess from everything I just said about transition phases, it's not a good one. Let's find out why. In phase two, aside from Cuphead, there are two relevant game elements. And surprisingly, neither of them are Canteen Hughes's plane. The first element is the four Yankee Yippers revolving around the plane. All four Yankee Yippers are, for all intents and purposes, identical. As such, all four of them count as one unique element. Again, some of you that are familiar with the boss may think otherwise, but we'll talk about that when we get to the secret phase. It doesn't matter how the player deals with the Yippers, so long as all of them are dealt with. Our second relevant game element is the Yippers' projectile, the Bow Wows. The projectile is fairly straightforward and requires that the players simply jump around it. Nothing else to it. Both of these elements together form an incredibly simple picture. Shoot the boss, avoid simple projectiles. And then there's the core mechanic of the entire fight, Canteen Hughes' biplane, which is just sitting there, feeling left out. It's not that the biplane isn't present in this phase, it's that the biplane just doesn't matter. It still functions as a minor arena hazard, but only in so much as it is a small platform that the player can fall off of. That's all it is. But what's interesting about the plane taking a back seat is that the mechanic itself does not change. It's still the same plane. The player can still maneuver the plane by standing on the wings, and a predictable motion curve still defines the plane's movement when the player jumps. So if the mechanic itself doesn't change, why does the plane cease to matter? Canteen Hughes' plane loses its significance along with the removal of all those game elements which interacted with it. In other words, Phase 2 strips out everything that made the plane matter in Phase 1. By simplifying the projectiles and boss positioning, Phase 2 eliminates the need to maneuver the plane. Not only is there no need to move the plane, there's not even a reason. Recall that in Phase 1, the plane served multiple functions. Moving the plane was necessary to stay on target as Pilot Bulldog moved side to side, but it also helped the player avoid the various projectiles. There was incentive to move the plane beyond just the simple necessity of shooting Pilot Bulldog, and the combination of necessity and incentives created depth, since necessity and incentive were often in conflicting states. A certain enemy projectile might incentivize the plane being in one position, while the boss position required another. That conflict created depth. With the removal of those conflicting elements, all that depth disappears in Phase 2. The result? The possibility space shrinks dramatically, and the core mechanic of the entire fight becomes irrelevant. 
Just like most transition phases, there is nothing to learn here and extremely limited gameplay possibilities. And with so few gameplay possibilities, why include it at all? Recall that one of the reasons to use upfront complexity is to increase the allowable depth and or difficulty. By reducing the complexity of later stages, we free up space in both the player's mind and in the challenge itself. This space can be used to increase depth and or difficulty, which naturally ratchets tension and creates a rising action. Here we can see a graphical representation of this concept. The rising action is overlaid on top of the relationship between complexity and difficulty slash depth. This graph is our guidelines at work in an ideal situation. Now let's compare this ideal graph to Dog on Dogfight. I'm going to keep saying this, in order to evaluate a single phase in a multi-phase challenge, one must evaluate the challenge in its entirety. This is how we identify structural issues. So let's start plotting what Dog on Dogfight looks like on our structural graph here. In Dog on Dogfight's second phase, both complexity and difficulty slash depth fall off dramatically, causing our rising action to stall and our mental burden to bottom out. In our ideal graph, we see that as complexity falls, difficulty slash depth rises. This keeps the mental burden at an acceptable level, thereby hopefully keeping the player engaged and also supporting the rising action. This reduction in complexity provides space for the difficulty and depth. In our ideal situation, reducing complexity has a purpose. In Dog on Dog Fights Phase 2, reducing complexity does not have a purpose. The possibility space becomes very shallow at the same time that it narrows, becoming low in both complexity and depth, resulting in an extremely small space with very little gameplay. Mind you, low complexity is not necessarily a bad thing as long as it is supported by depth. In this case, it is not, and unfortunately in this case, any tension we got from phase 1 evaporates. In our holistic view, looking at all the phases together, we can identify our first major structural issue with Dog on Dogfight. When we evaluated phase 1 by itself, we deemed it solid. However, when viewed in light of Phase 2's issues, we get our first glimpse of how tedium injects itself into previously well-designed content. There was a caveat attributed to Phase 1's solidness. The later phases must not overstay. When we look at Phase 2's possibility space, it is very clear that, just from a single attempt, the player will exhaust the small space. The player will experience and master all it has to offer, and when the player exhausts the possibility space, any additional attempt will be replaying exhausted content, thereby creating tedium. So this is like, yeah, we needed a th another phase for this. It's, it's, a, it's a phase, I guess. So, if a single attempt exhausts Phase 2's possibility space, Phase 2 is already overstaying its welcome by attempt number 2. That's really bad. And that's why transition phases do not work in a multi-phase challenge with forced replay. That was our first structural issue. Phase 2's possibility space is too small, so it's essentially dead weight. Now let's look at key learning. Early key learning points establish core skills that evolve as the challenge progresses. They allow a player to practice the most relevant skills as early as possible, which in effect reduces the chances for tedium. A player doesn't waste time on irrelevant skills in the early phases, and they don't get stuck practicing entirely novel skills in the later phases. In order for a mechanic to function as a key learning point, it needs follow through. It needs to actually be used. It's pretty clear from Phase 1 that Canteen Hughes' plane is the star mechanic. When we combine the star mechanic of the plane with the projectiles, we get a core skill. That core skill is maneuvering the plane while evading projectiles. This skill expresses itself in multiple ways, from jumping over the plane with its predictable motion curve, to crouching on the plane, to positioning, shooting, etc. of from around the plane. There are a lot of expressions of this skill, which if you just list them out, the possibilities are pretty exciting. There's so much you could do with this skill group. As a key learning point, Phase 1 establishes a lot of these skills and really primes the player to receive. It sets the player at the base of a huge mastery window and promises to deliver. So does Phase 2 follow through? Is the core skill used? Or did the player just spend an entire phase learning something that they don't need? No, no, no. Unfortunately, kind of. 
In phase one, the player jumps over the crossbone boomerangs at the same time they maneuver the plane. That mechanic is carried over into phase two, but unfortunately drops the maneuvering the plane aspect. Neither the yippers nor the projectiles incentivize plane interaction. Since the yippers fly in a circle, the player can hit them no matter where the plane is. And since the projectiles don't block off areas or in some way force the player to move their safe platform, the plane, it's a simple matter of evading them, something the player already does in every fight with projectiles. It's mundane, despite the boss having one of the most unique mechanics in the entire entire game. Moving the plane is pointless, so moving the plane while evading projectiles is also pointless, which recall was our core skill, maneuvering the plane while evading projectiles. That was the whole point of phase one. That was our key learning point. Yes, the player does evade projectiles in phase two, but the plane no longer factors. It just generally stays in the middle. Key learning point wasted. And here's the strange thing. Instead of focusing on that unique mechanic, Studio MDHR chose to carry phase one's most shallow and boring aspect into phase two. That is jumping over projectiles. Now, I'm not saying jumping over projectiles is a bad mechanic. That's a basic part of Cuphead. But I am saying that jumping over projectiles should not have been the focus when they spent so much time and effort making Canteen Hughes's plane so dang cool. Especially because the projectiles were only interesting in phase one due to their conflicting plane maneuvering incentives, which phase two abandons because there's only one projectile. Phase 2 had the opportunity to develop the plane mechanic further, take it to new heights, so to speak. <laughs> and therefore build new layers of mastery on top of the old. And by using layers of mastery, Phase 2 would have been a direct continuation of Phase 1. Build on the skills learned. This could be done, for example, by focusing on the confounding effect of the projectiles, a concept which has already been established. In this example solution, Phase 2 could use area denial attacks like the yarn balls or create some type of risk reward situation where putting the plane in a dangerous spot allows the player to deal more consistent damage. These two ideas would be a natural evolution of our skill avoiding the plane while maneuvering projectiles. By focusing on skills already learned, phase two becomes the logical next step in the challenge as opposed to random stuff happening. We get a cohesive challenge and we avoid tedium. And if Studio MDHR still wanted to keep phase two short, they could have. Phase two could have remained a transition phase, but have been justified as such by its use of key learning. Keep the phase short, but use it to build new layers of mastery on top of the established core mechanic. The only justification for a transition phase would be satisfied. However, again, only if the key learning point within the transition phase could not fit elsewhere. Worse than being a poorly designed phase just by itself, however, phase two retroactively makes phase one worse. Since phase two just kind of abandons everything we got out of phase one, it makes phase one look like a bunch of random attacks thrown together and forgotten about. Remember, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It all just seems disconnected. We've already established that Phase 2 has practically no replayability since the player likely exhausts its possibility space after the first attempt. This quickly becomes tedious. But again, we cannot just look at Phase 2. Recall that replayability represents any given player's willingness to replay content. And due to the nature of forced replay, that means playing that content in consecutive order. And this is why the connection between phases is key to the health of the challenge. Between the utter lack of depth, engaging mechanics, and mastery potential, in addition to an unsatisfying complexity curve that leaves the player wondering when the fight will actually begin, 
And because practically nothing the player learns in the first phase matters for the second, forced replay leaves the player wondering what the point of it was. In order for a multi-phase challenge to have early replayability, playing the early phases must seem worthwhile in the context of later phases. Phase 2 exists just to be gotten through, making it pointless and, by extension, makes Phase 1 seem pointless. Any replayability we had in Phase 1 disappears, or at least is greatly reduced. Not before long, trudging through Phases 1 and 2 feels like an eternity just to arrive at Phase 3. Every attempt at this feels like an eternity, as my skull screams out, Brett, why do you keep making loud noises and making it worse? Why? F***ing go away, you weird cloud farting freaks. Every attempt at this feels like an eternity. Honestly, the only thing I can say in conclusion about Phase 2 is that it should not have existed. Given the plethora of directions Studio MDHR could have taken this phase and included the core mechanic while they were at it, it's astounding they chose this one. The whole fight would be better if this transition phase simply did not exist. At least it would not retroactively ruin phase one. Look, Pim. I know it's our job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here? And then we get to phase three. And oh boy, does phase three turn everything on its head. Literally. But not in the way Studio MDHR intended. At the end of phase two, each of the Yankee Yippers are destroyed. And there was much rejoicing. And Sergeant O'Fara finally decides to join the fight. Zooming in from wherever the heck she's been this whole time, Sergeant O'Fara arrives in her giant metal beast, which, in a spectacular show of breaking the fourth wall, grabs the edges of the screen. Somewhere in the ideation process of this fight's design, when Studio MDHR were devising a core theme, they likely wanted to push the boundaries of player experience. This is a big hallmark of the DLC. Push boundaries, defy expectations. We um, really honed in on our craft, pushed the boundaries on what we were able to do. More challenging in the fact that we were pushing our limits in terms of the quality right. and the scope of what each boss is. Between riding on Canteen Hughes's plane instead of in it, and the fourth wall breaking Metal Dog Chinook, we can see that intent coming through. But while the Chinook gets a little handsy with the player's screen, they've got bigger problems to deal with, specifically lasers, which oddly enough have nothing to do with the dogs. Anyway, laser guns pop out of the Chinook's hands and shoot horizontal and cross screen diagonal beams for the player to jump. After that, we get our first look at the hulking metal beast's true power, screen manipulation. The Chinook grabs the screen and yanks it 90 degrees, changing the player's orientation and controls. Meanwhile, it's chow time, and Sergeant O'Fara pops out to finesse some buttons, which I guess makes dog bowls fly around. These dog bowls are similar to previous projectiles in that they mimic the jumping action of both the crossbone boomerangs from Phase 1 and the laser beams the player just encountered. But we're not done yet, folks. After the dog bowls, the screen flips a further 90 degrees, changing the player orientation yet again. The player must now control Cuphead upside down. Laser beams ensue. After this, the screen flipping continues all the way around in a circle until the phase is defeated, alternating between lasers and dog bowls each rotation. While Canteen Hughes's plane was clearly meant to be the star mechanic of the fight, Sergeant O'Fara's Chinook is its crowning achievement. Just from its visual presentation alone, the Chinook is awesome. Oh, oh this is cool. Okay, what has happened? What? Grabbing the screen like- I didn't know that was happening! I didn't know that was happening! What are you supposed- What the fuck is happening? Alright, let's see, yeah, let's get some intel. Uh, oh, dude! He ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh! Wow. Well, this is something else. Oh my god. That was very fast. No, oh, nuts. This is such a cool. Wow. We're in the last one. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh my gosh. Oh, what the heck? 
add in the utterly game disrupting screen flip and the combined complexity and crazy visuals of phase three totally eclipse the first two phases. Pilot Bulldog and the Yankee Yippers have nothing on the Chinook. It's not even close. Phase 3 is the core and crux of the entire fight. And yet, due to the nature of forced replay, players must trek through comparatively unremarkable phases to get there. What the f- what the f*** is this? Okay. That's rough. This is the first challenge so far. That was confusing. Oh my god! Oh my god! What was that? Like that, I don't know how I'm supposed to- oh! This is the worst thing I've ever experienced since- Oh my god! I just went the f my fingers! I just- Oh god, what are we doing? Holy- No! Don't put me upside down! No! This is so confusing! <laughs> I can't- Oh god! No! That's insane! Maybe that's like the only way you can dare- <laughs> Oh fuck this! Oh god! Oh. Oh God! What do you mean? It hurts my fucking brain. Yeah. No, 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 no. You know. Oh my God! What is happening? Ah! What am I supposed to do to that? How am I gonna deal with that? Do you remember when I said my brain couldn't handle the... And then that went ahead and just twisted it like Jason Voorhees would? This is the worst gimmick ever. What the fuck is happening? Where what am is I? going what? on? How do I... Why is Where it the worst? Why would they I do that? I mean, it's not that? the worst, but it's very difficult. I hate and it. And it's not fun. I, I hate, don't like it. I hate when games do the... Reverse the reverse control controls. shit, yeah. <laughs> Which brings us to our final and most damaging structural issue, bookended complexity. Naturally, since this phase is jam-packed full of late complexity, we'll focus on our structural guideline, late simplicity, to explain how Dog on Dogfight's third phase creates structural tedium. After that, we'll look at how the fundamental controls change of the screen flip invalidates previously established key learning points. Recall that late simplicity keeps the player's mental burden in check, thereby reducing the chance for burnout and allowing room to increase difficulty and or depth. Dog on Dogfight's third phase does not conform to our late simplicity guideline. Phase three is too complex. This bookended complexity creates too much mental burden and at the same time does not provide enough room for the drastic increase in difficulty created by the screen flip. The result, an overwhelmed player and tedious replays. As usual, let's start by first defining the game elements. Like every other phase, Canteen Hughes' playing, along with all its associated elements, remains the core mechanic. Yet, similar to Phase 2, the plane plays a relatively small role since it fails to interact with other game elements in meaningful ways. Everything we talked about in Phase 2 regarding the plane also applies to Phase 3, so we can largely ignore the plane and move on. Our next game element group comprises the projectiles. There are only two projectiles in this phase, the laser beams and the dog bowls. Compared to the first phase, this projectile group is relatively simple. Only one projectile fires at a time, and avoiding each of them entails a simple evasive jump. These two groups, the plane and the projectiles, contain a relatively small number of game elements compared to the same two groups from phase one, especially considering that Canteen Hughes's plane is a non-factor, an irrelevant game element. If we just look at these two groups, it appears as though phase three is simpler than phase one, which would conform to our late simplicity guideline. However, we do have one more element group that we have not talked about yet, the screen flip. The screen flip on its own is a simple concept. 
The screen flips and the player adjusts their controls relative to the plane's orientation. When the screen is on its side, as in the 90 degree or 270 degree flip, the player pushes the stick left or right to move along the plane. From Cuphead's perspective, he moves left or right, but from the player's perspective, Cuphead moves up and down. When the screen is upside down, the player's controls are still relative to the plane, so pushing the stick left moves Cuphead toward the left wing, but appears reversed from the player's perspective. To move left on screen, the player moves right and vice versa. So what's the purpose of the screen flip? Since it does not deal damage, the screen flip by itself is not a threat. That may seem strange, since narratively, the Chinook is clearly acting with malice as it yanks the screen around. Nevertheless, the screen flip is not inherently a hostile game element. What makes the screen flip dangerous is its confounding effect over top the other game element groups. The screen flip increases the chances a player will be hit by projectiles or fall off the plane. So, while it is not a threat itself, the screen flip increases the threat of other elements. In this way, the screen flip is similar to the yarn balls in that it creates conflict with other elements. This is potentially a great source of satisfying depth. However, I want to be super clear that the screen flip differs from the yarn balls in a fundamental way. The yarn balls are themselves a threat and they exist as their own unique game element. The screen flip, on the other hand, does not exist as its own element. The screen flip piggybacks on top of other elements. From a purely mechanical point of view, aside from the visual effect of the screen rotation, the screen flip adds nothing to the fight. It is not a game element with which the player interacts. Yes, it does require some experimentation from the player in order to determine which direction they must push the analog stick, and it does require spatial reasoning in order to orient to the new perspective. But on the most foundational mechanics level, the player pushes the stick to move and presses the jump button to avoid projectiles in the same way they would without the screen flip, just in a different orientation. The screen flip is not an element in itself. Instead, the screen flip changes existing elements. It embodies a fundamental game elements change, the effect of which changes all the mechanics built on top of it. If you were to flip the orientation of a foundation stone in a building, all the bricks, walls, columns, etc. that rested on that foundation stone are going to shift around. Wow. That's what we're doing here with our game elements. We're moving the foundation around. Changing the input required to move a character affects all of the game elements that interact with the character moving, which is all of them. The projectiles group and the plane group are both affected by Cuphead's movement. Changing the movement changes the other groups, essentially multiplying the complexity. The result being that the player has to relearn not only the fundamental controls of the game, but every single element and every single skill. And here's the kicker. For what purpose? Why is the player relearning every skill, including the controls, especially so late in the challenge? Whoa, what? The, hold, hold up. Wait, uh -huh. wait, are the controls, hold up. Are the, no, the controls aren't, they aren't, oh jeez. Now they are flipped. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what, how do I control that? The controls are like f***ed up, by the way. It's not like, it, 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 the controls don't change. It's like the controls are the same. Or no, it's all f***ed up. It's all f***ed up. Is down left in that? Yeah, what is that? What was that, man? Oh, man so I, like, I like my mind saw it and just gave up. I'm like, I don't, oh, I don't know. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, the controls weren't... Okay, the controls weren't flipped and now they are? And now they... Okay, what is... Okay, shoot. I can't figure out if the controls are flipped or not. So now we're gonna go up again. Nope, no, shoot, it did shift, it did shift. Recall that we used late simplicity to make room for additional depth and or difficulty. Decrease one source of mental burden to increase another source which fosters player engagement. Now, the screen flip certainly creates an increase in difficulty, but it does so at the cost of major mental burden from compounded complexity. So, to answer the question, for what purpose does the player have to relearn everything? 
Well, aside from the thematic big appearance of the Chinook, which is impressive, I'm not seeing one. Mechanically, we're increasing difficulty, but that's it. That's it. So, is an increase in difficulty worth the overwhelming mental burden? Or was there maybe a better way? Multiplying the possibility space might seem like a good idea because it creates more gameplay. However, the possibility itself isn't changed. It is simply repeated. From a purely mechanical perspective, each new possibility space is the exact same thing as the original space. We have not added anything new, or increased depth, or facilitated engaging situations. We've just rotated the space. <laughs> why? Just why? We can only guess, but it's clear in each of the DLC bosses that Studio MDHR wanted to get big player reactions from novel gimmicks wrapped up in huge presentation. This is a reasonable assumption because it's not just dog on dog fight. Each DLC boss incorporates remarkable mechanical and or thematic escalations in their last phases. The screen flip is certainly a shocking and entertaining surprise, mission accomplished in that regard. But that's the end of the positives. They got their wow moment, but they did so at the cost of overloading the player while disregarding both the core mechanic as well as the structure of the boss. Studio NDHR changed the entire foundation of the game at the tail end of an extended challenge and thought, this is fine. Overloading the challenge is not the only thing the screen flip screws up. It also undermines our key learning points, something Dog on Dogfight has trouble with already. We've already established that Dog on Dogfight treats key learning points and learned skills as if they're disposable. This is evident through the diminished relevance of Canteen Hughes' playing in phases 2 and 3, as well as the abandonment of the player's skill predicting and committing to safe zones created by enemy projectiles, both of which are interesting and engaging elements of phase 1 that are totally dropped in phases 2 and 3. The only learned skill that remains relevant throughout the entire fight is jumping over projectiles, which, of all the learned skills, is the least interesting. But then Phase 3 comes along, sees that last remaining key learning point, and tosses it in the trash with the others. Which is odd because the player still jumps over projectiles. The skill is still expressed in Phase 3. But because the screen flip forces the player to relearn each element from the ground up, all early key learning points are invalidated. The player learned jumping over projectiles already. Now they have to relearn it in phase three. Basically all skills start over. And that's essentially the same thing as saying that the fight does not begin until phase three. And if the fight does not begin until phase three, guess how much phases one and two matter? Am I hurting him? What the fuck? Dude, how am I supposed to play like this? Oh my god. Okay. That makes the first phase nothing. That makes the first phase nothing. That makes the first phase nothing. Well, here comes the tedium. The time it takes a player to learn an essential skill is a direct determinant of tedium. If it takes a long time to learn the skill, the player will get bogged down in a specific area or section of a challenge. After enough time spent replaying the same content over and over, the player will burn out. Because this one isn't too hard. It was just more just figuring out the mechanics of of that section. And, and I still, usually I'm not too thrown off by games when they like, you know, reverse controls and things like that. I actually, shoot, I always think it's really fun when they do that. But for some reason here, I'm not, you're not given too much time to really adjust and it's happening so fast. We just decided to throw these guys in here. And it's, it's, a, it's a phase, I guess. I think I hate this boss fight. I think I actually hate it. It sucks getting to the last phase and then struggling so hard when, like, I know I can do it. It sucks getting to the last phase. Key learning points serve to introduce essential skills gradually and with as little friction as possible. Therefore, invalidating key learning points will likely cause tedium. 
In some cases, invalidating key learning points might not cause too many problems. The player may be able to get by with a just adequate skill level. This is not the case with Dog on Dogfight. In Dog on Dogfight, the player must relearn the essential skills of jumping and moving or they will fail. The player will not be able to stumble through into a near win, they'll just fail. And, I bet you're sick of hearing me say this, due to the nature of forced replay, they'll have to replay irrelevant content to get back to the thing they need to practice. Games must handle changes in perspective and controls with care because perspective and controls are directly tied to a player's physical ability. Therefore, those skills take much longer to relearn than a mechanic that simply builds on top of them, like our foundation stone analogy. Dog on Dogfight fails to respect this unique, complex feature. For the sake of due diligence, I'll mention the run and gun level, Funhouse Frazzle. Changing screen orientation is not unique to Dog on Dogfight. Funhouse Frazzle introduces the mechanic in the base game, Isle 2. I mention this because if the player plays through all Cuphead content in the order of its release, the player will have experienced the screen flip previously. Certainly not to the extent that it's used in Dog on Dogfight, but still. However, I believe it's enough to say that each challenge in Cuphead is self-contained. The introduction of a mechanic in Isle 2 does not justify its poor implementation in the DLC's Isle 4, especially considering that the player does not need to complete the base game islands in order to play the DLC. All this was not to say the screen flip was a bad idea. It simply was not respected, and it was not done justice. The screen flip was seemingly implemented for no other mechanical purpose than to increase difficulty, which could have been done a lot easier and with less effort. If, instead, the screen flip built upon previously learned skills, such as maneuvering Canteen Hughes' plane, you know, that star mechanic the fight just ignores, and the screen flip was introduced earlier in the challenge, where the mental burden was relatively low, <clears throat> phase two, the screen flip could have been awesome. As it stands, the screen flip is pretty much just a frustrating mess. That is all three phases through the lens of our four guidelines. We can see how small problems add up into larger structural issues, and we can see how even just one problem can have a ripple effect in multi-phase challenges, potentially causing problems in entirely different phases. This is largely the work of Forced Replay. A multi-phase challenge with Forced Replay must be exceptionally well designed, or even a small problem can create tedium. Not to say that some of these problems aren't gigantic. In games, like a lot of things in life, there exists an illusion of importance. In a game, whatever task the player is supposed to accomplish feels important as long as the player remains engaged. Tedium wrecks that illusion. The player realizes that if the thing they're doing doesn't matter in the context of the game, it really doesn't matter in the context of their life. In a mastery-based game, if there is no potential for mastery, there is no game. There is no meaning. There is no accomplishment. There is no reason to play. Tedium can single-handedly destroy a game. Up until this point, we've focused extensively on structure and mechanics. But there's another piece of the puzzle that's essential to a game, and that is a unifying theme. A theme is an idea that ties an entire game, challenge, or level together. A theme expresses itself through visuals, audio, gameplay, and narrative. In Cuphead's case, each boss has its own theme. This theme encapsulates the surrealist inspiration behind the boss. In plain terms, the theme is what the boss is about. A boss's theme is the central core idea that ties every phase together into one cohesive experience, and as the glue that holds everything together must be supported by its game elements and mechanics. A core theme which is unsupported by its elements is not really a core theme, and elements which do not support the core theme are irrelevant. Video game designer and author Jesse Scholl describes unifying theme perfectly. 
The primary benefit of basing your design around a single theme is that all of the elements of your game will reinforce one another, since they will all be working toward a common goal. The sooner you have settled on a theme, the easier things will be for you, because you will have an easy method of deciding if something belongs in your game or not. If it reinforces the theme, it stays, but if it doesn't, it goes. Our goal is to create powerful experiences. It is possible to create games that do not have themes or that have very weak themes. However, if games have unifying resonant themes, the experiences will be much, much stronger. If you don't know what your theme is, it is very likely that your game is not engaging people as much as it could. That's putting it lightly in Cuphead's case. Likely due to mishandling its surrealist inspiration, Cuphead suffers from a lack of unifying themes, focusing on a stream of consciousness spewage of ideas as opposed to structured content that leverages its inspiration to create zany yet well-designed content. Cuphead's consistent lack of unifying themes creates bosses with disjointed phases, awkward and steep learning curves that arise partway through, and scattered-brained ideas. As an example of how the lack of a central idea or focus can compromise the structure of a boss, look at the abandonment of Doggone Dogfight's core mechanic, Canteen Hughes' plane. Phases 2 and 3 forget about the plane. The entire boss crumbled into a shallow puddle that completely wasted the potential of its core mechanic, resulting in no depth and nothing to master and leaving tedium in its wake. But the unifying theme goes beyond just core mechanics. The theme is what the boss is about. The idea that ties the boss together so that the boss's elements and mechanics can align with it. The theme should reinforce the mechanics and the mechanics should reinforce the theme. So let's talk about the visual star of Doggone Dogfight, the Chinook, and extensively question in an over-the-top fashion, why oh why is the Chinook not presented as the central theme and foundation of the boss from the very beginning? I mean, come on, look how cool it is. The Chinook has a monolithic presence that far outshines Pilot Bulldog and the Yankee Yippers, and this presence sets up the Chinook as the clear star of the show, not simply because of its size, but because of its commanding presence, because of how it dominates the screen. No other antagonist in this fight commands the same presence. The Chinook does this primarily through its hands or paws, or helicopter feet, whatever they are. At the start of the fight, the Chinook's huge daunting hands grab the screen, creating a wall on either side of the playable area and creating a sense of enclosure, a feeling of being trapped. And this is awesome because it does two things. Firstly, this visual enclosure creates two danger zones on either side of the player. And these danger zones just so happen to lie perpendicular to Canteen Hughes' axis of movement. They constrain the player's movement, or at least give the appearance of doing so. So, the Chinook is interacting with the boss's core biplane mechanic in a big visual way. Secondly, the hands help establish the theme, the us or them, only one of us makes it out of this alive sort of mentality. As soon as those hands go up, the player is trapped. We've entered the clinch, the standoff, the true dogfight. It's visceral and it's super effective. Because the Chinook is colossal in its presence and its fantastic thematic framing, it creates an expectation that it should be the central focus and hook for the boss. It should be the focal point of every phase. And by solidifying the Chinook as the central focus, we would gain a greater emphasis on Canteen Hughes's plane, the core mechanic. The Chinook interacts thematically with the plane very well. Having both of them present in every phase would carry that strong dynamic throughout. The Chinook is the perfect central idea that ties every phase together into one cohesive experience. The core theme reinforces the core mechanic, and the core mechanic reinforces the core theme. Now the foundation for the boss is set, and the rest of the boss can be built on top of it. Unfortunately, the core theme instead resides in only one third of the fight, and the absence of that presence and thematic framing compounds our existing problems. We already have structural issues that make the phases seem unrelated and irrelevant. But then, once the player witnesses the grandeur of the Chinook, it feels like the first two phases are just warm-up. The fight doesn't even start until the third phase. 
The result, the rest of the boss becomes noticeably disjunct and overshadowed. Dude, how am I supposed to play like this? That makes the first phase nothing, nothing. For example, remember how phase two quickly becomes a menial pointless transition phase after a single attempt? It's a phase, I guess. Phase two's flaws become, unsurprisingly, more noticeable once the player realizes that the awesome central Chinook phase is basically tacked onto the end as an addendum. The Howling Aces should be a single unit boss centered on the Chinook and not an arbitrary multi-unit boss. I mean, come on. Studio MDHR actually chose to create a multi-unit boss out of one of the most grandiose designs in the entire game. And need I remind you, the Chinook hosts one of the most complex mechanics imaginable, the screen rotation, which was unironically placed at the tail end of a multi-phase challenge. What is going on? So, clearly Phase 2 was a travesty by its own merits, but also when compared to Phase 3, both mechanically and thematically. Case closed, nothing more to say. Phase 1's pilot Bulldog, on the other hand, is a much more interesting story. Firstly, even though Pilot Bulldog makes for a solid first phase mechanically, he isn't reinforced by the central theme. Pilot Bulldog is overshadowed by the actual star of the show. What's intriguing about Phase 1, however, is how it appears that Studio MDHR was at least somewhat aware of the Chinook's commanding presence and thematic framing because the Chinook actually makes an appearance in Phase 1. Partway through the phase, the Chinook wiggles through the sky and blasts out homing fire hydrants which then descend toward the player. Yeah, that's right, those fire hydrants come from the Chinook, and I bet that comes as a surprise to many of you. The Chinook's fire hydrant artillery is more obvious when watching a playthrough, but is surprisingly tough to notice while playing the game yourself. This is because the Chinook does not maintain a reasonably strong presence throughout. Remember our mental burden. A player only has so much space in their head, and they will only pay attention to those elements which are immediately relevant. In Phase 1, the Chinook is presented as background information, literally in the background. The background is not relevant. If a player even notices the Chinook, they will likely ignore it since its presence is supported by neither strong visual nor audio cues. For something that commands such presence, it's a wonder Studio MDHR put it in the background. Here's a compilation of players not noticing the Chinook in the background. I have a double jump. Oh my favorite. Ugh. About you. Here's another compilation of players who notice the Chinook in the background but are unable to determine what it's doing or what its purpose is. Or they notice the fire hydrants and don't know where they come from. Getting that. Oh, well, what's this thing in the background? I don't like that. I don't know what that thing in the background is doing. I think you can't notice. You still- Why- Oh, wait, wait, wait. Why does the- The dog- I didn't realize this because- There's uh, fire hydrants. Well, they're shooting fire hydrants, but also he's shooting cats. Look at the background. That looks so cool. Oh, sh**. Uh, I haven't even seen the second phase. Fire hydrants, really? Okay. And there's a dog copter. No. There are several reasons why the Chinook is easily missable background information and wasted potential. Firstly, the Chinook only shows up for a couple seconds. It doesn't become a prominent or even reasonably noticeable figure. Naturally, players are going to miss an important detail when it's only briefly shown, especially given how much there is to concentrate on in the foreground. Secondly, while we can briefly see the black cannons on the Chinook, the weapons disappear before the Chinook flies from the background into the foreground and thence off screen. The smoke from the cannons also blends into the clouds, making even that detail hard to notice. Thirdly, the fire hydrants don't arrive on screen as a relevant game element for another 6 to 7 seconds, so it's easy to disassociate them from the Chinook. Fourthly, when playing a game that demands one's entire attention, the player will concentrate only on what immediately matters. There's only so much concentration to go around. Anything that does not immediately matter is filtered out. That doesn't mean, however, that background information cannot be useful. The information must simply be conveyed in a way that makes it seem immediately relevant to a burdened player. 
Captain Briny Beard's shark is a good example of this. The captain whistles to spawn the shark, and after its background telegraph, the shark immediately performs its attack. The background information here is the shark, but that background information is accompanied by a visual and audio cue. These are immediately relevant because they are performed by the captain. If the Chinook wanted to be a part of phase one, as it should be, then one easy yet significant change would be to incorporate audio cues. In order to draw attention to the Chinook, there could be a distinct and noticeable booming sound as each of the cannons fire, followed by a whistling whoosh sound as the fire hydrants close in. This would invoke a sense of persistence and continuity and would help tie into the theme. Imagine the player's anticipation when they hear distant cannon reports followed by a whooshing sound. That would be intimidating and it would help build the Chinook's presence. As an alternate visual presentation, the Chinook could have flown up beside the player at the screen's edge to fire hydrants from the foreground. A clear visual cue like this would make the face feel more dynamic, although it would likely overload the visual space. Phase 1 is already at the tipping point of the game elements it can support. Adding any more visual elements would serve only to clutter the screen. So, even with better sound design, the Chinook would still be confusing. To fix all these issues, we would have to make some hard decisions. It's a given that Phase 2 should be entirely reworked to better integrate the Chinook and probably introduce the screen flip while we're at it. But Phase 1 is a different story. Phase 1 is a pretty solid phase. We would want to change as little as possible while giving the Chinook space for its thematic framing to work. But given how cluttered Phase 1 already is, the Chinook could not be given more space without subtracting other elements. And subtracting elements would ruin the carefully designed interaction between the projectiles and the plane. Phase 1 balances on a pinhead, changing anything would throw it off. So, do we simply add some audio cues and leave Phase 1 alone, allowing the Chinook to take over Phases 2 and 3 after Pilot Bulldog is defeated? Or do we start subtracting elements from Phase 1 and build it all back up with greater emphasis on the Chinook? Or does the Chinook take over the entire fight and assume its role as the centerpiece, replacing Pilot Bulldog as the antagonist of Phase 1 and embracing an ascending challenge structure like we see with Captain Brinybeard? Pilot Bulldog could still feature in Phase 1, but he would play the role of the background attack dog instead of the central antagonist. Essentially, the roles of Bulldog and Chinook would be reversed. This third option begins with the Chinook and ends with the Chinook, and all other antagonists exist to complement it, creating coherent phases and obvious core skills, all centered around both a unifying theme and core mechanic. This is called designing a boss. Whatever direction a theoretical remake of Dog on Dogfight would take is beyond the scope of this video. But the problems are very clear and the possible solutions in this case study align with solid and well-defined game design. All that matters is that Dog on Dogfight must be structured in not only its mechanics but also its theme. Without sufficient gameplay or mechanical structure, the boss would feel unsatisfying, tedious, and frustrating. Without a sufficient unifying theme, a player will be less likely to engage with the boss. The boss will feel disjointed and will appear as a shallow assortment of objects. For those of you unfamiliar with the DLC, or for those of you who've only played it through once, and especially for those of you who don't play a game by reading the wiki, you may be surprised to know that Phase 3 has an alternate version, a secret phase, which can only be triggered by defeating Phase 2's Yankee Yippers in a very specific way. To unlock the secret phase, the player must reduce each of the Yankee Yippers' health below a threshold, at which point that individual Yipper's smoke turns gray. The player must then be careful not to deal any additional damage to that Yipper because, if the player destroys any one Yipper, the secret phase will remain locked until the next attempt. Once all four Yippers pass that health threshold, the Chinook comes and chomps them up, thus starting the secret third phase. It's important to note that the alternative Phase 3 differs from the standard Phase 3 visually, mechanically, and thematically. The alternative phase is extra optional content, but it's not just the same phase reskinned. 
it is its own phase, strangely one that's nearly impossible to discover through natural play. Which begs the question, why does it exist? In a game with very little optional content, why spend the development resources to create an alternate version of something that does not serve an alternate purpose? In other words, why create the secret phase if it has the same purpose as the original phase? That purpose being, beat the phase, complete the boss, continue the game. Like most of Cuphead, the phases exist for the satisfaction of beating them. But if we're going to create new optional content, I would argue that new content should offer something new. Does the secret phase exist just to be beaten? Or does the secret phase serve some other purpose? Does it exist to be discovered like an Easter egg? Does it exist to offer a mechanical variation of the screen flip? Or does it exist because Studio MDHR had too many ideas and just couldn't decide? Does it even have a reason? Keep this question in mind as we explore the secret phase and all it has to offer. Since the secret phase is its own phase with unique visual, mechanical, and thematic aspects, let's briefly talk about what those are. First off, the secret phase shares the same monolithic, domineering presence and initial thematic framing as the standard phase 3. The same huge, daunting Chinook hands grab the screen, creating a wall on either side of the playable space and creating a sense of enclosure, a feeling of being trapped. It's a visceral, almost personal standoff, a true dogfight where one of us is careening below. It's super effective and interacts with Canteen Hughes' plane in a visually significant way. What is unique to the secret phase is what happens next. The Yankee Yippers pop out of the paw pads and start throwing grenades at us. And this is what's really neat about the secret phase. Recall that one of the major sources of tedium within Dog on Dogfight is its utter lack of mechanical follow through. Dog on Dogfight routinely establishes key learning points and then immediately throws whatever skill the player learns from those key learning points in the garbage. The player quickly learns that none of the skills they're practicing matter in the larger scheme of things, so each phase feels isolated and inconsequential. But the secret phase, and specifically the pineapple grenades, buck this trend. The secret phase actually uses previously established key learning points, and most importantly, integrates our core mechanic, Canteen Hughes's plane. Recall in phases 2 and 3 that Canteen Hughes' plane stops mattering because none of the boss's projectiles require the plane to move. In fact, most projectiles after phase 1 actually encourage remaining stationary. Phase 1 established the key learning point of maneuvering the plane to avoid projectiles, but then phases 2 and 3 don't use it. That's not the case with the pineapple grenades. The pineapple grenades incentivize moving the plane. They do this by locking onto the player's current location and following a trajectory that would guarantee a hit should the player remain stationary. A player cannot stand still after being targeted by a grenade, or they will take damage. The grenades force the player to move, and forcing the player to move forces them to interact with the core mechanic. But that's not all, there's another level to the grenades. To further encourage interaction with Canteen Hughes' plane, the grenades are destructible. Wait a minute, shouldn't being able to destroy them make them easier to avoid? Nope, because the pineapple grenades do what grenades do best. They explode, and they create a big fanning hazard similar to the phase 1 tennis balls. If the player destroys a pineapple grenade, the fairly easy projectile turns into one that's much harder to see and avoid. Instead of having the player want to destroy the grenades, the player wants to avoid them. And by simply moving the plane side to side, the player can consistently do so. The grenades don't change trajectory, so once they're in the air, it's easy to predict where they'll fall. Add to that a huge telegraph window on each of the grenades, and we start to see how the secret phase takes those skills the player learned in phase 1 and reuses them. Maneuvering the plane is once again essential to beating the boss. But that's not the only thing the secret phase takes from phase 1. Remember how phase 1 was full of confounding effects? Same thing for the secret phase, and the plane is the center of it as it should be. Let me outline all the pieces because understanding the confounding effects requires a holistic view. There are three pieces, Sergeant O'Fara, the Yippers and their grenades, and the plane. The only way to beat the secret phase is to deal damage directly to Sergeant O'Fara, the central antagonist of the fight. Any damage dealt to a Yipper does not reduce the remaining health of the boss and serves only to make that Yipper retreat into its hatch. So shoot the sergeant. Got it. However, Sergeant O'Fara does not make it easy. Similar to Pilot Bulldog from Phase 1, Sergeant O'Fara is constantly moving. She pops in and out of the hatches, making it hard for the player to get a bead on her. 
Because the player can only fire in six directions by holding the aim button, the player must position the plane in the optimal location according to the hatch O'Fara pops out of. Each of the hatches requires a different position. If O'Fara pops out of the bottom hatch, the player may easily target her no matter where the plane is. If she's in either of the top two hatches, however, the player must fire up at an angle. You can see these angles here. Where the firing lines touch Canteen Hughes' movement axis is generally where the player needs to position the plane. Notice how the lines originating from the middle hatches require the player to be fairly close, while the lines originating from the top hatches require a center screen position. And this is where the confounding effects come in. In order to shoot O'Fara, the player needs to position the plane in specific places. But in order to avoid the pineapple grenades, the player needs to constantly move side to side. Just by themselves, these two elements conflict. This is good. However, that's not all. The player must also be careful not to shoot the pineapple grenades, and since the player is constantly moving side to side, the trajectory of the pineapple grenades will frequently intersect with the player's firing line. All of these conflicting elements create depth. Thank goodness, finally our core mechanic gets used. Now, let's compare the secret phase three to the standard phase three. The secret phase has some key strengths compared to the standard phase. Firstly, the secret phase has mechanical follow through. Key learning points are used and this helps foster a cohesive challenge. The confounding elements concept introduced in phase one is also carried into the secret phase in a way that creates satisfying depth. Secondly, the Chinook's hands are fantastic as a thematic element. As the border of the arena, the hands help create an image of bouncing between a rock and a hard place. Thematically, the hands are great. However, compared to the standard phase, the secret phase does not have a whole lot of spectacle. That's where the standard phase really shines. The standard phase 3 utilizes the Chinook extremely well by not only zooming in on its face, but by using its hands to rotate the entire screen. This is big and impressive, both thematically and mechanically. The hands demonstrate that Cuphead is outmatched. The Chinook can just yank us around however it sees fit. In the secret phase, we lose a lot of that spectacle. The secret phase uses the hands, just not as spectacularly. As launch points for projectiles, the hands serve an important mechanical purpose, and they create a cohesive challenge. But it's really just the same thing as phase one, dogs throwing stuff at us out of holes. Overall, the secret phase is a much tighter challenge. It's well designed and complements phase one. But when compared to the standard phase three, we can see why Studio MDHR went with the screen flip. So let's go back to our original question. Why does the secret phase exist? Seeing the comparison between the two phases, I'm going to speculate. It's likely that the secret phase was the original standard phase. It relates to the mechanics of earlier phases and creates a cohesive challenge. But it's kind of boring. So, Studio MDHR scrapped it and came up with something new, but they didn't really want to just get rid of it since they've already done that work, so they made it a secret phase. And that's all part of the design process. Ideas evolve and stuff. But let's give Studio MDHR the benefit of the doubt and assume they made the secret phase for a better reason than our original idea was boring. Again, that was just speculation. There's no way to know for sure what Studio MDHR's intent was since they unfortunately did not respond to me for comment. Let's look at our first reason. The secret phase is a puzzle. The Yankee Yibbers have the potential to be a small yet interesting puzzle. The secret phase acts as the reward for solving that puzzle. Hints and clues would be placed in the overworld and or boss and the game would reward players for piecing them together. The act of discovery is a game all in itself. Unfortunately, this was not done. It should have been done, but it wasn't. Generally, Cuphead doesn't prop up the game's secret phases. It doesn't provide clues. Dog on Dogfight is no exception. And if the player isn't given clues, how are they to discover these secret phases? Through natural gameplay, and by this I mean playing the game without any outside sources such as online playthroughs or wikis, and only experiencing the game as it is presented through gameplay, through natural gameplay there is only one other method by which a player may discover a secret phase. Sheer accident. Except, given how unlikely that is, the overwhelming majority of players are never going to know about Dog on Dog Fight's secret phase unless they see it online. So, while the secret phase is a potentially welcome surprise because it's different and unexpected, figuring out how to unlock it is not a satisfying process. It isn't really a process at all. It just happens. The player just stumbles upon it. 
And while accidentally triggering the secret phase is surprising, the actual act of discovery is absent. If a player stumbles onto the phase and they don't know how they got there, the player will just be confused. They'll start looking for clues, but there won't be any to find. Gab and Brett experienced this very situation. After they accidentally trigger the secret phase, they lose, then have absolutely no idea what caused it in the first place. Why? Oh! Oh! Oh, super mega secret level! I'm here now! And my life is so much worse! I got the secret stage! Where the dogs are alive and I'm full. No! Gab in particular tries to experiment to figure it out, but is ultimately unsuccessful. Thank you. They've been jumped on! Oh. So when I see the lady. Oh, lasers. That's new! What the f? What do I do? Okay, I will not attack the little doggos. And then I might have like a different outcome. I will just take the letters and wait it out. Mike also tries to solve it on his own, but there's nothing to solve since there are no hints or clues. It's just there to discover on the internet, which is exactly what he ended up doing. Okay, so I think you have to get every single letter. If you miss one, then you won't get the secret uh, phase or whatever. Should I be hitting them? Maybe I shouldn't hit them. No! I don't know. That probably messed me up. I missed one. No, I guess I didn't do it right. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, so the YouTuber Flambons made a video about it, and if you shoot the trails... Okay, okay. I did it wrong. I thought you had to get parry. I was wrong. I have to get all of their... You have to get all their smoke black? Oh, okay, I got one. This is harder than it looks. Three, just one more. Oh, so that theory is unsupported. Without the act of discovery, the secret phase can't be a puzzle. What if the secret phase instead exists as an accessibility option? The screen rotation changes the fundamental controls and visual orientation of the game. This not only forces the player to relearn the controls, but also inherently increases the likelihood of physical limitations. Oh, hello. Whoa! What the- hold, hold up. My mind saw it and just gave up. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm dead. <laughs> Okay, shoot. I can't figure out if the controls are flipped or not. Therefore, because a change in controls may produce problems involving physical limitations and input devices, an alternative third phase would, ideally, provide an equally challenging scenario that does not fundamentally change the game. However, we've already established that Cuphead's secret phases would work best if they acted as discoverable puzzles rather than random stumbling points. And that same idea extends to accessibility. There is one simple reason why the secret phase cannot be an accessibility option. Accessibility cannot be used if it cannot be discovered. Because the secret phase is not reasonably discoverable by players who may need it, it would be dishonest to say that it exists for accessibility reasons. The only way someone that needs the accessibility option could discover it is by reading about it online, and a game's features should not depend on external sources for the player to know about them. But, get this, we actually do have an accessibility option for this fight. This is an option that is specific to Dog on Dog Fight and only appears for this boss. And we have an unnecessarily confusing naming convention to go with it. The default controls, which change the orientation to the perspective of Cuphead, are considered R Control A. However, the player may change the control type to R Control B. For R Control B, the player's movement is no longer relative to the plane, but to the player. When the screen is on its side, the player pushes the stick up and down to move along the plane instead of left and right. The player can swap controls whenever they want. But in case you were worried this accessibility option would be too accessible, don't! In addition to the confusing name, the R control setting comes with unnecessary trial and error. Unlike a truly accessible option, this one does not provide a tooltip or any useful indication of what it does. You just have to figure it out. R control A. What? Huh? What does this mean? That's new. Is that like something to do with the plane? You control the plane by uh, like walking on it. Let's after this one, I'm going to try R control B and we're going to see if it's like different. Try it in the overworld. Let's go back to the overworld. Wait, what is R control A? What the f
fuck is that? What? I don't know. Right control A, right control B. I do I don't know. Let's exit to the map. Been I still here. don't know what's going on with the uh the R control or whatever. Oops. I don't know either. I think it's for whenever it flips in that crazy direction, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Oh, you know what? It might be uh, level specific. Yeah, I think it's level specific. I know this is a crazy idea, but I believe a feature which changes the controls should tell you what it's changing the controls to. It's a plain and simple concept. But this is the same studio who wrote those awful charm descriptions shown in my previous DLC video, so it's par for the course. Imagine playing through the Howling Aces up until Phase 3, only to realize that R Control A or R Control B is not the control scheme you thought it was. Or maybe you just didn't know what it did. Oh look, you're dead. You have to start over. Now you have to change the R Control setting again and try to figure out what that one does. That's called trial and error and creates tedium and frustration. Additionally, since nobody initially knows what the crap R control A and B means without tedious trial and error, most people are simply going to ignore it, even if R control B would help them. Players who would love to use R control B will never discover that it exists because it sits as an undefined setting. That's called a lack of transparency. I'll go into more detail on trial and error and transparency in the upcoming Esther Winchester design video, but suffice to say here, it's bad. But that's somehow not all. Remember earlier when MatPat was overwhelmed by the controls during the screen flipping? Well, ends up his confusion of the controls has real merit. Whoa, what the, hold, hold up. Wait, uh -huh. wait, are the controls, hold up. Are the, no, the controls aren't. Now they are flipped. Okay, the controls weren't flipped and now they are? Okay, shoot. I can't figure out if the controls are flipped or not. MatPat is, in fact, correct. As we've discussed, for our control A, the controls are relative to the plane. So moving left moves left on the plane, right moves right, up looks up, and down crouches. This should work the exact same across all orientations, upright, sideways, and upside down. The controls work perfectly for upright and sideways, both 90 degrees and 270 degrees, but for whatever reason, when upside down, everything is backwards. When you're upside down, moving left moves right, right moves left, up crouches, and down looks up? Incredibly, while upside down, Cuphead moves the exact same between both control schemes, R control A and R control B. What does this mean? It means the R control B control scheme somehow bled into R control A. While upside down, Cuphead should not move like R control B if the player has R control A selected. Instead, Cuphead should move left when pressing left and look up when pressing up. We can already reasonably estimate that the R control option was not thought through as an accessibility option during the design and planning of the DLC, but it goes beyond that. Mixing the two control schemes together is a massive and careless oversight for what's supposed to be an accessibility option. At best, it's inconsistent controls, and that's bad enough as is. So not only is the secret phase virtually useless for accessibility purposes, but the R control accessibility option is also pretty much useless and doesn't even work correctly. Let's move on to our next reason. Honestly, at this point, I'm just scraping the barrel. Does the secret phase exist as an easier phase three? At first glance, this idea seems to run counter to the established design intent of Cuphead. If a player is unable to beat a boss, that player is expected to practice until they can. Offering a secret option that is easier than the intended difficulty would violate this principle. Primarily due to the screen flip, the standard phase 3 is much more difficult than the secret phase. The secret phase has the benefit of relevant key learning points, making the learning curve shallow. The standard phase 3 does not benefit from key learning points, so the learning curve is steep. This is the major source of difficulty and the reason why the standard phase is so much harder. And that creates a problem. The secret phase now circumvents the challenge of the standard phase. In a mastery-based game, this is bad. But let's not dismiss this idea yet. Let's look a little closer. 
there is a way an easier phase could work, and that is by tying the easier phase to the act of discovery. If discovery is a game all in itself, then we're not subtracting gameplay by making an easier phase gated by that discovery. But the key here is to lean into the idea of optional content. We cannot have an easier phase that serves the same purpose as the standard phase. That would violate our design intent. But we can have optional content that's easier. Instead of counting as a defeated boss, which is required to beat the game, the easier secret phase could give the player an optional reward. For example, completion of the easier secret phase could award the player a special rank, or distinct indicator of completion, similar to the special pacifist P rank awarded when completing run and gun levels without hurting enemies. Or instead, it provides no rank whatsoever, but rather a new equipment option. That'd be really cool! Or maybe the overworld is all just one big puzzle, and if the player completes all of those puzzles, they get a unique game ending or something. The DLC already introduces something similar with the secret graveyard boss. Players unlock the boss by talking to the lantern, shovel, and pickaxe NPCs and using the information they provide to solve an overworld puzzle. And it works pretty darn well. A giant overarching overworld puzzle is probably an idea getting too big for its britches, but you get the point. Make the easier content optional, make it its own thing, and it doesn't have to conform to the original design intent. But none of what I just talked about exists. This is all just theoretical. So obviously, this is not the reason why the secret phase exists. That just brings us back to our original question. Why does the phase exist? And honestly, I don't have an answer. The phase is not reasonably discoverable, which makes all of the reasons it could exist moot. And since it's not reasonably discoverable, it's essentially wasted. Which is a shame because the secret phase is pretty well designed, if a little lackluster, and given the numerous problems the standard phase 3 has, it's a bummer that the two weren't combined. Take the best elements from both and leave the bad. Combine the good mechanical follow through of the secret phase with the big thematic presentation of the standard phase. And since we've got the entire second phase to rework since it's garbage, we can introduce the screen flip earlier on, making the whole thing more cohesive. Introduce the screen flip earlier, reduce mental burden, and carry key learning points through the whole fight. So anyway, um, you know, here's your two hour examination of a two minute boss fight. Game design is complicated, but thankfully you have this channel to subscribe and come back to. Nice. Listen, don't leave quite yet. This video is brought to you by you, the viewers, the people who find enough value in this channel to wait patiently for each new release. I am always working on the next big project in between videos alongside my amazing developmental editor and co-author, so I hope the quality is noticeable and thank you for making it worth the effort. If you're interested, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to be notified of each big release. Liking the video and commenting also greatly helps the video gain traction. Just you being here and watching the whole video is the greatest support you can show, so thank you very much. I also can't run this channel without my lovely Patreon supporters. The Design Frame Patreon currently has multiple tiers on a per video basis. I do provide benefits, but I overall want to ensure that if you support the channel monetarily, please do so not for the few benefits here and there, but according to the value you see in this content. Please also understand that the Patreon is above and beyond, so don't worry if you don't or can't support financially. Take care of yourselves, and God bless.